ER folks, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is episode 16 of Gopit Lodge's Fracking Show. I know we've taken most of August off, but uh, taking a nice break. We're here at the beautiful sunset here at Gopit Lodge. Uh, Ah, that's better. Uh, yes, so my name is Dee Shanger. I'm a mod and live stream director here. We have a whole host of guests here at Gopa Lodge. They're just finishing up their weekly meeting. I'm just setting up the screen geography here. Oh, Howard! Look at that gorgeous, gorgeous <laughs> view here. Howard! Did a big D. Big D means fart. Mm hmm. Hi, Howard. Hi. Yar. Yar. Oh, thank you, uh, Occupy TV. We're being restreamed. Uh, thank you, uh, Dan and Yar. Uh, Aloha, Dan. Yar. Um, and we'll probably be restreamed later at Global Rev and others. Yeah, so we've taken a nice break. Um, this is our weekly Gopit Lodge. Uh, um, Fracking show where our motto is protect the water and yeah, we're slowly easing back in the saddle uh, We have a few guests um, One of the topics we'll be discussing tonight. There's a New Brunswick provincial election now for those of you that don't know The way Canada's provinces and territories are Canada has ten provinces and three territories up north um, and Certainly, of all those 13 entities, New Brunswick is the poorest province on the, on, in Canada. Um, New Brunswick also operates very much like a very, very super corrupt third world entity. Because this province here is controlled by J.D. Irving Oil Limited. Uh, they own everything. Oil, uh, shipbuilding, 95% of the mainstream media. Uh, they own it all. You name it, forestry, you name it, they own it all. And um, as we've talked about numerous times on this uh, show, certainly um, world international uh, corruption and transparency experts have labeled <laughs> New Brunswick. Yes, folks, this province here, New Brunswick, the most corrupt government on the planet, either federally or provincially. Now you'd think the U.S. government, Israeli government, a lot of governments would be more corrupt than why would the New Brunswick government be so corrupt? Well, by their definition of corruption, why New Brunswick is the head of the list is every single deal. Like we're talking pretty well 100% of every single deal that this government makes with industry they are always on the losing end that is the dictionary definition of corruption and there's a provincial election coming up September 22nd now in this province's history it's 99.9% .9 they either elect liberal or conservative they're all bought and paid for by JD Irving but JD or, or, or Irving owns the courts. It's like corruption. I think I he, I understand in all of New Brunswick's provincial election history, th there's been one NDP ever ever elected. And fracking is a huge issue in this elections. Now the conservatives who are in power right now have uh, said that fracking is on the table. Uh, they're going to increase fracking right now. Uh, there's 39 fracking wells in Penobscot, which is just about an hour and a half south west of here, and they're proposing four here in this area alone. Um, and we've talked about on this show how we're going to be hounding um, SWIN, SWN, Southwestern Energies, from Houston, Texas. It's the fifth largest fracking company in uh, North America uh, super super corrupt uh, and of course Swin and Corridor is in Penobscot with 39 wells um, Swin is proposing four wells and uh, none of the, either Corridor or Swin can do any business here without paying penance or bakshish to the Godfather, quote unquote, uh, J.D. Irving Oil, uh, 
such a corrupt entity. Well, I think, uh, we, you know, there's a big debate tonight at the community meeting here every Wednesday night um, about how we're going to vote. Um, certainly, when you have a history of just liberal and conservatives, and both are bought and paid for by Irving, uh, when you have a history, as I understand it, the only other party that's ever been elected is one NDP seat, as I understand it. That's it. Um, that you know, you vote liberal or conservatives, that's J.D. Irving bought and paid for. So um, what are the alternatives? The New Democratic Party, a Green Party. Uh, there's a lot of independent candidates running. We have a Green Party candidate here. She will be speaking a little later on. Uh, Hector Picatou. Um, he is the ex, he's Mi'kmaq. He's ex-national chief of the Atlantic regions. He is a wealth of knowledge. Um, and Norm from Dublin. Hey, how's Dublin tonight? Norm. Yar. Oh, uh, okay. I'll save that link there, Frederino. Andrew Younger statement on Norm. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that link there, Frederino. Yes. Um, yeah. So um, Dublin is fine, says Norm. And Yar from Dublin. Yar. Um, yeah, it's great to be back. And uh, some of you might have noticed that uh, we also live stream. I have to clean up the archives. It's sort of August. It took a month off. But we also live stream the uh, People Social Forum in Ottawa from uh, August 21st to the 24th. We were one of three official live stream channels with uh, rabble.ca and 99media.arg from Montreal, that cyborg Simon. It was great to see Simon. It was great to see uh, Raven Chelsea from Calgary. We're going to be working with her uh, for the 8th Fire Gathering, which is at the end of February. We're the official live stream channel of that. And, uh, yeah, that's going to be really, really good. Um, so it's good to see a lot of people there. As expected with the People Social Forum, two years in the making. Um, um, it's the largest gathering of the left in Canada. It was actually a historic first of just the people that were there. It was heavily financed by the unions. So the who's who of the unions were there. Um, now, for you, those that don't know about the union movement in Canada... There might as, well, might as well be a wall around union activism in Quebec. Quebec labor have never participated historically in the Canadian labor movement. So to see the who's who of Quebec labor and Canadian labor working hand in hand at the PSF and helping finance it is one. The who's who of First Nations were there. The who's who of Quebec activism and a lot of the people from the Quebec student movement, a lot of people of the Canadian left. Uh, it was historic on so many levels. And to be invited there as one of the three official live streams. Um, you also notice that when I live streamed, I live streamed with Octo here at Occupy Toronto um, with, um, when I was using the laptop. And I did a lot of stuff with my cell phone. So I did a Ustream.tv, uh, D Shanger, D E E Shanger, S Hanger, um, Ustream channel. And uh, one of my favorite events is Shannon Chief, who's been a guest on this show many times. Um, uh, it was great to see her in person uh, there. I live streamed her uh, talk on. Um, on Thursday morning and uh, then I get a text message from her Saturday morning say the Algonquin Kukums the grandmothers they're the ones that control everything uh, they request your presence uh, thank you there Fred um, and uh, thank you for that band there Fred way to go uh, good. The penalty box. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I get a text message Saturday morning saying the Kukums request your presence uh, at 4 o'clock this afternoon. That was Saturday. Um, and uh, please meet at the People's Tent in People's Square at the University of Ottawa where everything was happening. Sure. Um, and I ended up starting at 5. It's the Kukums. And uh, it was really, I didn't know what to expect. They just request your presence there. And... Uh, the um, 
um, they were like the Pied Piper, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, that day was all these assemblies, three-hour assemblies for different things, like one for water, one for First Nations, media, African, like all kinds, mining, justice. So at that time, there's a whole bunch of assemblies. So what they they started off, there there were the two Kukums, uh, Eliza and Shelley. Um, they started with the drummers behind them and people following, and uh, the uh, um, they went to one assembly, the the democracy one, unannounced. They just went in, they went in first. The drummers behind them, they did five ten minutes, well, about. 10, 15 minutes of speech, and then they left. And, and they went to five different assemblies. Uh, and as they went, they got more and more people. And then they ended up at where they were going to do a strategy session. So it was about two hours and 11 minutes worth of live streaming. I was using my cell phone. Um, it was really, really wild. Um, um, I think by the end, they had over 100 people following them. Like I said, they were like the Pied Pipers. Uh, they got standing ovations everywhere they went. And then they ended up at where they were going to be. And they asked, uh, we don't want this live stream, this part, because it was a two-hour plus strategy session, which was fine. Because one thing about the People's Social Forum is there's 500 workshops in three days. Between three of the live stream channels, we couldn't even hope uh, to have covered everything. But I was already in the rhythm where... Um, for every time slot, it was mostly 75 minutes and then about 10 minutes, 15 minutes to get to the next one. I had A, B, and C because sometimes the workshop you're doing is running over. Uh, so I, um, so one day at the end of this action and they were going into a strategy session, I said, great, no problems. Thank you for telling me. I, I was glad that I was able to do what the Kukums wanted. And... Uh, and I understand, yeah, no problem. Uh, I was getting out the laptop ready. I was going to live stream that from the laptop. And um, I, I live streamed the whole thing on the D Shangri Ustream account. Um, I was going to switch over to Octo here as you're watching. And uh, so when they said, because it's a strategy session, no problem. Um, I wanted to do the vigil for Gaza. So I ran off, did the vigil for Gaza, and came back for the last half hour just to sit in. And the Kukums invited me to their camp in um, northern Quebec. Um, two days later, we went up to the camp. Uh, so it's one thing to be invited to uh, to uh, the camp by the Kukums. For those that don't know, you know, Kukum means grandmothers. In the First Nations, it's the grandmothers that are and the clan mothers, which are the ruling uh, base of. Uh, and they control everything. You can't be a hereditary chief without the approval of the clan mothers and the grandmothers. Uh, certainly, it's the grandmothers that control the warrior societies and the warrior chiefs. Um, so to be invited to their new camp um, was a great honor, and I gladly accepted. And even greater, it was the Kukums that met us and took us into the territory when we did get up there uh, late Monday night. They had a huge feast ready for us. Uh, it was me and the four other people from Elsie, Elsa Buktog here, um, that, yeah, it was beautiful. That was, that was my highlight. I really, I like seeing a lot of people that we had live streamed, uh, you know, the people, uh, Frida and Tengi from the Unistoten camp. Um, they had a great discussion. They want me to come there to help live stream. I was talking to the Unistoten chief. Um, totally uh, wants to live stream from there. Uh, a lot of technical things. We, we had a long, long chat about it. And uh, really, really wants. Because um, the one thing um, that he really, really likes, uh, Tenge, the uh, Unistoten chief, what he really, really likes is the same reason we were invited here to El Sabukto. One, it protects people on the ground when there's heavy police action, which they're right in the way of the Northern Enbridge pipeline. Um, and when the RCMP come to crack heads, uh, you know, uh, they love the fact that it'll protect people on the ground and that they can get out the word unfiltered. Because right now they don't have a sustained coverage and what I suggested is, you know, that 
even before I get there. Uh, and I could train them via satellite as well. Um, that they should do a weekly show, all right? Um, and get it started that way. Um, audio's fine on, on my end. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so the Unistoten uh, chief wants us to come there to help train live streamers. The Kukums want us back at their new camp. Um, yes, and uh, it's it's uh, fun times, and uh, we're in full blown. Um, audio's fine there, Za. Yar, it's on your end. Yar. <laughs> Oops. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, got it. Way to go, Za. And, uh, and others. Uh, there was a suggestion um, by uh, some, I don't know, more lieutenants um, that, I sh that <laughs> myself and Occupy Toronto should do a national live stream tour and just go around to different places to train live streamers. I mean, I said line it up. Uh, I'm there uh, because there are a lot of camps a lot of places there's no shortage of places uh, that need live stream chaining um, so stay tuned for that as well um, you know I kept thinking so much of the digital shaman you know the the nice van fully live stream gear that you know runs on biodiesel and just drive around and <laughs> Go to different. Whoa, the warrior chief. Hey, what the? Who the? What the? Uh, national live streaming. That's what it would be. The I don't know more national live streaming tour. So a lot, a lot of it was a lot of uh, met a lot of good people there. Uh, I met a lot of people who have been on this live stream channel before, but only via Skype. So it was good to finally meet him in person. Um, <laughs> nice. That's a good hashtag. I don't know more, LT. Yar. So that's just some of the uh, ideas that came out of there. Um, yeah, it was good to uh, talk to um, uh, it was good to see a lot of people in Toronto uh, that I missed that were there. Uh, yeah, and it was good uh, to be invited there. I mean, the only reason that I could have gone is because I know two of the organizers there, the head organizers, and they really wanted people from Elsa Book to, to be there, and they wanted me to live stream because they were severely short. Plus, there was no hope in hell of even three live stream channels covering 500 workshops in the, in the three days. Even though it was a four-day event, the, the fourth day, Sunday, the 24th of August, uh, was uh, uh, certainly um, uh, just one final convergence thing. And if you notice below here right now, if you're watching live, I, I need to clean up the archives, but that's fine. Uh, that'll happen. Plus, I'm going to put the stuff that I did on on uh, um on the d shanger ustream account onto this archives and we're going to create a special uh, psf people social forum 2014 um video on demand folder below here and what i'm going to do is probably next weekend um, mirror all the stuff from rabble tv did and what 99media.org from montreal did so that the, uh, forever there'll be a PSF one and there's some stuff that I did with the Algonquin uh, Kukums that was so remote especially in a clear-cut area that I videotaped it and I and I want uh, to Skype in Shelly and Eliza to Algonquin Kukums when uh, I screened that here um, so those are some of the things uh, we got lined up as well uh, in terms of what's happening here in Nelson book took uh, October 17th, which is a Friday. Uh, yeah, I know. It's a satellite signal or digital shaman. Um, and uh, But here on October 17th, which is a Friday, we're going to have a special all-day uh, um, stuff happening at Camp 134, as it's called here. 
uh, in the first anniversary, and maybe it's like it's Howard, the digital shaman. That's right. You know, on the as well on the flip side of the People Social Forum. When you have the gar largest gathering of the left in Canada, which the People's Social Reform was, was, you know, you know there's going to be a lot of infiltrators uh, there. Uh, and what's funny is there was enough of them that we've known for years that they're fucking infiltrators. Like, but they're still there, We're pretending nothing's happened. Yeah, um, whatever. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's just just to mention that. Um, <laughs> oh, hey, <laughs> lobster roll. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yes. We've been eating so much lobster. Hey, show, show the world. <laughs> Dublin wants one of those lobster <laughs> rolls. Oh, wow. That's Ivan. <laughs> How you doing, Chief? Good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what, what do you got to say to the world? Nothing right now. Just taking my break. Just enjoying your tobacco. Okay. What's going on, Serena? Say hi, world. I, I want you to marry me. Will you marry me, D? <laughs> yes. She didn't even got on one knee. Okay. <laughs> Live. <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> Be careful what you ask. <laughs> I got a good ace. Yar. Next time you kiss me on the spot, you'll have to think about it. Make you home now. Make you be home now. No, not yet. 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, well, Ferguson. Yeah, uh, we've been following Ferguson. Uh, you know, I've been lurking a lot, even though I've been taking a break. I'm lurking a lot on uh, Global Rev. Well, <laughs> I know nothing. <laughs> and uh, I think Ferguson... In a nutshell, is Bundy Ranch, EMC Squared, you know, because um, mainstream media, you know, the police says, don't, don't, don't show up, uh, you know, have a media ban, and they go, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, and everyone is watching, like, as far as I remember, in St. Louis, how many live streamers before Ferguson? Nada. And what happened to Mike Brown? And now, how many are there? To see one live streamer, you know, on day five, after uh, Mike Brown was assassinated by the Fergus PD, um, uh, the uh, it was uh, one live streamer had like thirty thousand viewers watching him live, and he'd barely been on for like four or five days, and he had over a million views already. Uh, that. Is live stream right what it shows to you know and when you have the worldwide media wanting news about Fergus and they have to mirror live streams to get their coverage yes. civilian journalists of the world unite I uh, yeah there's Bundy MC squared absolutely uh, and uh, <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> Nelson you want to come on the live stream? Oh, come on, Nelson. You always have a lot to say. Yar. So, uh, oh, it's the Rono show. A show within a show. Yes, yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, I, Fergus, it's sad what that, you know, um, Mike Brown was assassinated. Uh, by the uh, Fergus PD for doing nothing. Uh, absolutely uh, in incredible. Um, <laughs> time shift coming up, Bruno. And, uh, but to see the coverage and the sustained coverage and to see the amount of viewers, it's like the old days of Global Rev, to see hundreds and hundreds of viewers of Global Rev. Uh, I love it. Uh, excellent coverage by the live stream. It was so great to see Tim Poole there. Um, you know, I love Tim Pool. You know, um, 
But the fact that he got swallowed up by Vice News, and I, as far as I can remember, it was at least almost a year and a half since he last live streamed. So to have him in St. Louis was really, really good. I think it was, uh, on a personal note, I think it was an absolute uh, mistake for him to be working for Vice News because it took him out of what he does best, live stream. You know, and, the, and there was always a worry of being swallowed up by, well, I wouldn't call Vice News mainstream media, but still, yes, he travels here and there worldwide, and he does his video reports and then, you know, edits and then post them, whatever, and I'm sure he's making good coin, which all the power to you, because none of us are making anything here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was great to see Tim Pool there. It was a pleasant surprise, to say the least. But certainly, um, the way to go when, when so many live streamers are covering it um, uh, was to watch something like Global Rep, which was mirroring all the live streamers and uh, keeping up with everything. Uh, yeah, it was really, really good. Uh, ah, Vice News is corporate owned, eh, Zah? Yeah, but the fact that he's not live streaming, which is his forte. You know, uh, uh, as far as I know, he was never a filmmaker. So he's doing the reverse uh, where, remember, folks, live stream is a whole new medium. It's not filmmaking. It's not video. It's a whole different. Vice is Canadian. Vice Magazine is Canadian. Yes, uh, but Vice News is a whole different entity than Vice Magazine. Yeah, as I always understood it, Vice News has nothing to do with Vice Magazine, which is Canadian-owned. Um, and yes, so Vice News is a whole different entity. I think the only thing they share is the fact that they're called Vice. Um, and I don't think the two are, are linked. Uh, but Vice News, uh, corporate-owned, eh? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. And even... You know that he's been there about a year and a half, uh, at least. Could be a little longer. Uh, he's taken out of the game. He's hardly doing any work. It's interesting that he would show up in here and there, and it was absolutely wonderful that he was back in the saddle. But he should just go solo again. But then again, yes, I understand. You got to put food on the table, right? Ah, Robert Murdoch owns Vice, so they're swallowing him up, and his contract's pretty airtight, so I'm sure he can't get out of it and stuff. Yeah, so Hector Picto is in the next room, holding court, so to speak. There's always a lively discussion when <coughs> Hector's here. He was here for the powwow on the weekend, and he dropped by Gopit Lodge, and he loves what we're doing here. Uh, Hector Picto is the um, um, ex-national chief of uh, the Atlantic regions, and he's very outspoken. Um, pretty wild. Guatemala defies Monsanto law, pushed by U.S. as part of trade agreement. Wow, Fred. Holy moly. Wow. Yes, so it, like I said, uh, more or less, we took all of August off, um, more or less, and uh, it's great to be back in the saddle, and uh, yeah, so this is episode 16 of Gopal Lodge's Fracking Show. We're here to stop fracking dead in its tracks and protect the water. Some updates. We now have three brand new camps, in addition to Camp 134, where the RCMP uh, did all their nasty stuff on October 17th. Uh, we have three camps. Um, um, there are four proposed fracking sites where, because the provincial election here is September 22nd, uh, there's not much activity on that front, but come September 23rd, it's going to be full blown. So we've staked out three of the four sites um, and uh, we got a 
eyes on the fourth side. So that's a huge update. That's in the last, uh, they're, they're part of what the Mi'kmaq here in LC and what Gopal Lodge is doing is we're reclaiming the land. And in reclaiming the land, we're actually building structures uh, there and we're staking out that territory. And uh, we got eyes on the ground. We, Like I said, our strategy to stop fracking here, SWN, is to hound them like a hound dog at every fucking step and live streaming is a huge part of that um, yeah and uh, yeah so that was uh, quite wonderful uh, what we're doing here and uh, it's very much a media warrior and community headquarters here at Copa Lodge it's a beautiful beautiful entity um, Okay, Lady Zaga about Vice magazine established by Soroshi Alvi, Shane Smith, and Gavin McInnes. The magazine was launched in 1994 as the Voice of Montreal with government funding and the intention of the founders was to provide work and a community service. Uh, when the editors later sought to dissolve their commitments with the original publisher Alex Laurent, uh, they bought him out and changed the name to Bice in 1996 in, uh, in search of more streetwear advertising income. The magazine, uh, magazine's personnel relocated, relocated to New York City in 1999. Andy Capper co-founded the UK division of Bice with Andrew Creighton. In mid-August 2013, Rupert Murdoch bought them out. I'm live. Um, yeah, so yeah, help yourself. And uh, Rupert Murdoch's Corporation, 21st Century Fox, invested uh, 70 million in Vice Media, resulting in a 5% stake. Following the announcement, Smith explains, we have set ourselves up to build a, 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 he's going to pose. Yar. Wow. Seventy million dollars for a five percent stake, that's it. And that's what Tim Pool is part of. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna be on to explain all that. Yeah. We got one of the Ute here. Reese, how Hi. was school? It was it was fun. I well, had a great time. What you learned in school? I learned multiplication, and I learned how to play multiplication bingo. Bingo! Bingo! Oh, just to finish, we have set ourselves up to build a global platform, but we have maintained control. In June 2014, a couple months ago, it was reported that Time Warner was negotiating to acquire a stake in Vice Media. Among the company's plan were to give Vice... Yar, wow. Tim Pool, I'm sure they got an airtight contract with them that he's probably locked in there for a while. So even if he wanted to leave, he, he couldn't. I'm guessing. Uh, you know, that's how they swallow us up. Right? I'm sure he's getting good coin. Uh, attempt to give Vice uh, Media um, among the company's plans were to give Vice control over programming of HL, uh, HLN, a spin-off network of CNN, which had recently struggled in its attempt to refocus itself as a younger skewing. Hmm. CNN, what a fucking joke! Yes. Hmm? No. Uh, younger skewing social media aren't a new service. However, the deal fell through as the companies weren't able to agree on proper valuation. In turn, it was revealed in August 29th, just last week, that A and E networks. Huh? A and E. That's gotten away from its original mandate too, as uh, Arts and Entertainment Network, A and E, American. Uh, a and E Networks, a joint venture of the Hearst Corporation and Walt Disney Company, would acquire a 10% minority stake in Vice Media, 
for 250 million. What the fuck? Holy shit. Wow. Thank you for that. Lady Zaga, our co head mod with uh, Fed 109. And we're here live at Gopit Lodge. Coming up, uh, stay tuned. Uh, we have a. Yeah, Mula Mula. Yar. And uh, we have a whole slew. Uh, oh. Uh, Howard, can you get a chair? I need, I need that a chair here. Not oh. there, in there maybe. For our guests. Oh, yep, confusion abound about vice. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that's pretty wild. It's episode 16. Ah, thank you, Howard. Howard, the hardest working person here. Howard. There we go. What we got? The two headed monster. <laughs> yep. Your Fred 109 huh? and Lady Zaga are two co head mods here at um, Occupy Toronto ER. And uh, mm -hmm. two headed monsters. That's a good one, Lady Zaga. Good to have you back. Hope all is well with you, ladies. Uh. Oh, uh, throw it in the compost. The ute. The ute. Howard TV rocks it. Howard TV. Howard the Duck. You know, Howard hasn't seen the movie Howard the Duck or the, mag or the uh, comic book. We keep telling about it. Howard's still waiting on his bus. Howard, where's the bus? Boat, he says. <laughs> Howard the Duck. Yar. Oh. oh, did we just lose connection? Yeah. Okay, we lost connection and we're here we go. We're back, Yar. Yep, it's it's now we're back, Yar. How you doing? All right, it's a little laggy, but that's fine. We're back, and um, yes. So, uh, any, any questions? Because it's been a while uh, from the live chat. Um, we're here at Gopet Lodge on Elsabuktug uh, First Nations, formerly Big Cove, New Brunswick, Canada. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is episode 16 of our weekly Gopet Lodge's fracking show. It begins at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, yeah, yeah, even though we're one hour ahead here in the Maritimes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, my name is Dee Shanger. I'm a mod and live stream director here um, since day one on October 15, 2014. Any swindlers around? Uh, yeah, well, Swin's activities have been very uh, minor, more uh, because two of the sites, they need to build a road and then uh, electrical wire, uh, you know, electrify it. Um, and, and that's the province is taking care of that bill. So uh, we're on them. Uh, on, nope, we have yeah, eyes yeah. on the ground at all four proposed sites and there. other places. Um, and um, so we're going to be hounding them. Now, here's a funny thing. The, you will. Um, I thought it was weird when I heard this, but about two weeks ago, Swin, of all people, hired some elders. Okay, some elders. Wait, where, if you're watching this in the archives, we're not live. Okay, so Swin, about two weeks ago, hired some elders here to locate where uh, the medicines were. And they marked them with yellow ribbons. Uh, 
and uh, we thought it was funny because uh, uh, maybe it's because it's an election year. Because certainly Swin does not give two fucking shits about anything First Nations as all their activities so far is proven. So the fact that they hired uh, some elders to point out where the medicines it were, uh, it was a 50-50 split here. Some were like, okay, whatever. And the others were like, well, wait a minute. Uh, is this a PR stunt? Or is this a fact that they're going to label the medicines and then, you know, another corporation is going to swoop in and, and patent those medicines. Um, I, and anyway, I, I think it was a bad idea. I don't think anyone here thinks it was a, uh, a good idea to be working for Swin. Um, just a PR stunt. Um, considering that the reigning conservatives here provincially are running on a pro-fracking um, um, platform and certainly the liberals they're the ones that brought fracking in, so they're not going to get rid of it, um, you know. Those, so, yeah, swings all around silently. Whenever they see people, they run for the hills. Um, there's been numerous stories about surveyors, you know, um, running when they see us. And we're all over them. We're all over them. And uh, we got a lot of exciting plans for those swindlers. Uh, but really, they're keeping more or less a low key. Uh, but come the day after the election, September 23rd, in three weeks. Yeah, they're going to go full tilt. And so are we. And uh, yeah, and so three new camps established. It's part of what we're doing here at Gopa Lodge and Elsa Boktog, uh, of we're reclaiming the land. And soon uh, we're going to have uh, longhouses built on those. Uh, one of the sites is going to be uh, um, uh, land that, uh, okay, why are we down? Okay, hold on. If you're watching this in the archive, just waiting to go back live. Um, and, yeah, this is weird. Said it's the, this should not be happening, but I guess because we're talking about we'll swim, uh, it's going in and out. Water. Hold on. Um, Yes, so at one of the sites, uh, eventually we're going to build longhouses at all the, the, the four proposed sites and any other, because Swin has plans for thousands of wells, fracking wells. Um, right now they have four proposed sites. Um, yeah, can you keep that door open, please? Um, okay, just outlining uh, this. Hold on. We're, if you're watching this in the archive, I'm just waiting to go back live to our viewers. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you're watching this in the archives, uh, I know it's all fine. I'm, I'm just on temporary hold here until we get reconnected. ER. Um, is someone on the computer there? Because I'm down here. Are people using the uh, internet? Because I'm down. Yeah, cause I'm for I'm I'm down. You're hogging all the bandwidth. Okay. Down. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we're back. Uh, as I was saying, take three. So what we're proposing at these new uh, sites um, is is the uh, not proposing, but what we will eventually do, right now we have temporary structures up, and what we will do is uh, establish longhouses at all those four proposed sites. We know where they are. Um, 
Two of them require that the province see the corruption of this province. It's Swin that's reaping the benefits. But in order to get to the fracking wells and get all the machinery and the trucks in, uh, two of the sites of the four proposed sites, they have to build a road and then put uh, electrical poles and then they can start bringing the trucks in. So we know where all these are. So we're going to establish longhouses. At one of these sites, we're going to establish um, um, a nature training center, for lack of a better way of putting it. Uh, but it's all part of uh, our strategy of reclaiming the land. And uh, yeah, we're going to hound them at every step. If they saw it, what they saw uh, last year, uh, they got another thing coming. Actually, our job this year is a lot easier than last year because last year Swin was doing seismic testing, which means they were all over the province and they had people running ragged all over the province trying to stop the seismic testing. At one point, for about five, six week period, they had um, all their sumper trucks were held in a compound that highway 134 which they blockaded the camp so the all the thumper trucks were you know uh behind a blockade that's why october 17th happened the, five, the rcmp spent five million dollars arresting hundreds of people they had four to five hundred officers uh the sq by the way new news we found out last week the sq was involved uh, provincial police of Quebec, um, the U.S. Army advisors, the U.S. Rangers, uh, they were using snipers and uh, attack dogs, using pepper spray, like they were watering their suburban lawn. They had a helicopter, drones, um, planes. They had the works uh, just to release all the thumper trucks, which that was the action of October 17th. So really, our job is easier because now they're going to start fracking so they're at a fixed GPS location so it's a lot easier to blockade them now we're not stupid enough to think because it's an oil company we don't believe anything that comes out of their mouth that these are the four proposed ones which they have to release publicly but we're keeping our eyes and ears throughout the whole province because they might have us focused on these and then they're they're fracking anywhere because we elsewhere because we know we know that they have proposed uh, the when they get in their full rhythm they want thousands and thousands of wells uh happening as well uh, other updates in the last month uh the new brunswick's uh provincial uh, department of natural resources has requested in the tri-city area the moncton dieppe riverview that they want to dump frack water frack waste water or just frack waste um directly into the water treatment plant. Now, <laughs> uh, not much is happening on that front, except that the province has requested, uh, there's three city governments. It's a tri-city area, but they share one water treatment plant. Now, if you know anything about frack waste, you cannot treat frack waste. You know, there's uranium, there's benzene, there's all kinds of fucking shit in that. If left untreated, it'll take Mother Nature like thousands of years to treat that. So they want they want to dump frack waste. <coughs> and that affects maybe a quarter of a million people, 200,000, quarter of a million people, uh, which means forget it. Yar. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, um, okay, so we're, we're back. Um, the, uh, yeah, so there's a fight there at the municipal level, and that's going to be an issue in this election. Um, yes, we're, we're not letting the election, uh, sway us, uh, from what we're doing. Uh, we know that th things will be on the QT in terms of the swindlers and fracking, just because it's an election. Uh, but we still d have people dealing with the election and getting the vote out and uh, getting uh, anybody but a liberal and conservative in, um, in, in office anywhere. And the fact that th this Premier Allward, who's a real nasty piece of work, uh, He's a real fuckface. Um, he is the, just a pawn, 
I'm sure. I'm sure it'll be revealed years mm -hmm. later that his offshore account is fucking account. healthy. Just a pawn of J.D. Irving and swindlers and the guy's a fucking douchebag in my fucking opinion. Uh, you know, that he is running on a pro-fracking thing. And, like, the fucking nerve uh, piece of fucking shit uh, that he is. Um, anyways, that's just my opinion. And about, you know... A million other people here in New Brunswick, so uh, we'll see. But then again, you got to understand that here, this is the poorest province and territory in Canada. It is owned by an oligarchy. J.D. Irving owns this province, lock, stock, and barrel. Owns the politicians, owns the courts, owns like 95, 98 percent of the mainstream media, and even the one public one, CBC, is pretty useless here. The only good one is a. APTN, Aboriginal People's Television Network. Um, but uh, yeah, so, and then you got the live streamers. You got blogger, Charles LeBlanc, uh, is an amazing person. Um, and, um, you know, there's Miles Howe, uh, Halifax Media Co op. Um, and then there's us, and there's a few live streamers. There's Charles Thibodeau, he's a filmmaker here in New Brunswick. He's in the North Shore in Keswick. He is running provincially. He's a filmmaker and he's been fighting the whole forestry um, raping and pillaging by industry because um, stupidly in the most corrupt province anywhere on earth uh, government uh, the um, they turned over the management of the forest um, here in New Brunswick to JD Irving uh, and uh, yeah, it, it is insane what's going on here. Deer populations is being decimated. Uh, they're planting the, the shitty soft pines like jack pine. They're killing off all the hardwoods. Uh, it's just a fucking mess. They own the courts, J.D. Irving. Uh, so um, that's why you've always had liberal and conservatives. Um, the fact that the conservatives got in four years ago, whoa. And it was the liberals previous to them that signed the fracking deals. Yar there rise. Yar. Orange is the new black this season, says Lady Zaga. Yar. Oh, thank you, Rise. Global Rev. Yar. Uh, just yar. Beautiful. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Rise. Uh, thank you, Global Rep, for mirroring us. Thank you, Occupy TV, for mirroring us. Uh, thank you to the world for watching. As I said earlier, for those late tuners and Global Rev, uh, we more or less took August off, and now we're back in the saddle. And this is Gopit Lodge's Fracking Show, episode 16. And, uh, yeah, we're right in the thick of it. And... Um, we're here live at Gopit Lodge in Elsa Booktook First Nations in New Brunswick, Canada, on the East Coast, the Maritime. Here in New Brunswick, generally known in Canada, is the certainly the poorest province of all of can, the Canadian provinces. And that's because it's owned by J.D. Irving. And because J.D. Irving uh, runs this as an oligarchy. Um, J.D. Irving is a nasty piece of shit corporation they own the oil 95 and the 98 percent of the mainstream media they own the politicians they own the courts they own fucking forestry shipbuilding you name it nothing gets done so when swin houston-based southwestern resources um uh comes fracking up here and when corridor comes fracking up here they gotta pay their bakshish and their fucking uh, you know um, bribes to the godfather, J.D. Irving. Um, nasty piece of shit. Uh, there's a conservative government here. There's a provincial election coming up in three weeks on Monday, September 22nd. Um, yeah, and we're we're going to hound those fuckers. We're going to be using live stream as a huge, huge tool as part of that fight because uh, we know that live stream protects people on the ground because the cops hate it when you're live. Um, you know, I, I, I know in Fergus, uh, the, the cops, you know, I call what happened in Ferguson, uh, you know, what happened at Bundy Ranch, EMC squared, uh, really, uh, because 
what Bundy Ranch and what Fergus Ferguson um, uh, did is show people en masse who wouldn't normally have known um, that mainstream media is useless, that they're getting most of their news from mainstream, uh, from uh, civilian journalists. You know, you look at that the Fergus PD, Ferguson PD calls for a media blackout and like go over pile and over like okay mainstream media because you know we're gonna get our news just from the police chief you know and even though you know, international media wants to cover what's going on in Ferguson um, they have to go to the live streams um, you know so really what what's uh, what I see happening uh, uh, as far as I can remember and rise Fred Zah correct me if I'm wrong but before uh, Mike Brown was assassinated by the Ferguson PD. There was zero live streamers in St. Louis that I can remember. And now how many dozens of live streamers? I, I, I mentioned it earlier that there was one live streamer. I think it was on day five or six. The guy had just started. Um, and to see 30,000 live viewers. And in those four or five days since he started, uh, there was like he had over a million viewers views on Ustream. And I forget which one. I don't know. Uh, I totally forget which one. But to see so many live streams coming out of there, I think it's absolutely amazing. Um, you know, I love the motto, hands up, don't shoot. I love that motto. It's quite amazing. Yar. Yar. And, uh, yeah, and so here, uh, fracking, uh, yeah, Swin. Houston based swindlers, we like to call them, uh, Southwestern Energies. Um, fifth largest fracking company in North America. Nasty piece of shit. Um, they propose over a thousand fracking wells um, and, and they haven't built one yet. They're uh, about to build four, but because there's a provincial election here, September 22nd, in about three weeks. Uh, just sort of a lull in activity. We're keeping eyes on the ground at all those four sites. Um, and we're going to hound those fuckers at every fucking step, uh, period. Um, no ifs, ands, or buts. And, uh, yeah, and live stream is a huge part because we know live stream, at least here in Canada, you know, it protects people on the ground. Because what, what I, I found here in Canada is cops are scared fucking shitless when you're live. And live being the operative word. The cops don't give a shit that someone's taking a photograph when they're beating the crap out of someone or someone's taking a video of them because they know they could seize that camera and video camera or cell phone, right? But when you're live, especially us where our reputation precedes us, uh, yeah, they and you're live to a worldwide audience and when there's violent police action, yeah. Sad to say, you know, as some people call it uh, riot porn you know, or cop porn, you know, sad to say, um, that the viewership goes up and you're being restreamed at dozens of places. Uh, yep. Okay, uh, we're down again. Yeah. Um, someone's hogging the bandwidth, uh, or we, we're being, uh, yeah. And we're back. Yar. Yar. Uh, you can probably hear me, but the image is frozen. Is that correct, Za and Fred? Uh, we're frozen again. We're down. Is someone hogging the bandwidth? Watching videos? Okay. Yeah. We are okay. We are back. Just, just checking, folks. Uh, so we're being jammed somehow, uh, and maybe it's that new NSA program. Depending on what we're talking about, especially that we're talking a lot about those fucking swindlers, Southwestern Energies from uh, Houston, Texas, and uh, Yar. Uh, okay, microwave pop popcorn time. No, we're not using the uh, microwave. <laughs> I think we need a hard line to this. Uh, that way, it'll be better. Damn microwave. Uh, an another, for those that missed it, uh, the RCMP about a month ago, less than a month ago, used a new tactic on me. Uh, 
they uh, used a, a portable it looked sort of like a video camera it took me a week to figure out it was professor x the co-inventor of the ocucopter that when i explained him what happened he knew exactly what it was but the rcmp it was new brunswick day and the premier was there and he had a huge entourage of undercover rcmp as part of his security and blogger was there blogger knows everybody including the head of security pointed out all the rcmp to me uh, it was about an hour and a half into the stream. I was using a laptop, and all of a sudden, the screen went black. Uh, I had to do uh, some hoodoo voodoo to uh, save the masters and stuff. Um, the long and the short of it is, when I got home, I uh, plugged in the laptop. It was charged, and, and it wouldn't charge. It was at 39%, um, and which was strange. The screen should not have gone black. The screen should not have done this um, and um, but what and and analyzing the video the last 30 seconds of the video that someone came by me on this side of uh, this side of the screen right with a video camera and then five seconds before I actually went down uh, the, the head of the RCMP security for the premier of New Brunswick here I was smiling at me and then I went dead um, what they had used is an EMP, electromagnetic pulse. They had zapped my laptop and bag with this uh, and in what looked like a video camera. So what Professor X said is when they zap you with an EMP pulse, um, it fries your battery, meaning whatever power is in there is in there. You can never in a million years ever charge up those batteries. Um, but what I found really, 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 really stupid like, like, but then you're dealing with the premier's office, and let's let's do that to this guy. You know, why reveal this tactic on a useless lull of a time? Like, why? I think it's really, really stupid of them to flag this, and like, not much was going on. So now I know how to combat that, and I'll leave that in my head for a sec, uh, because um, you know. So my my two laptop batteries are totally fried. Um, that's one of the reasons why during the People's Social Forum in Ottawa uh, a couple of weeks ago, I started live streaming from my cell phone and the D Shanger Ustream account. Um, but I couldn't figure out, it's rare that I can, but then I got people I'm like sorry. Professor X, I'm live, uh, and uh, to tell me exactly, uh, yeah, it's on the bid for a New Brunswick Day in Kokan. Um, yeah, it was the funniest thing. And, and what I, I think why they, they use that tactic is the premier was in a public place. I am media. And there was a point where after he spoke publicly, I just followed him around, followed him around, was cutting cake and handing out cake. And then some big wig, he seemed like a big wig because Howard was in his rhythm. The premier was in his rhythm. Howard? Is this you, Howard? <laughs> Beetlejuice, Howard. So he was in his rhythm, and all of a sudden, he stopped dead what he was doing, and he went off to the side to talk to this guy. And to me, it smelled like, this is a big way to, to, you know, like, whoa, he stopped everything he was doing to talk to this guy who was there briefly. Now, I was about 10 feet away. I followed him. To that corner he was outside he was in a public place and all of a sudden because blogger had already pointed out who is head of security and all these other rcmp guys were undercover and uh, um and so i had every right to videotape blogger had pointed out who these people were and they were for the first time in the whole afternoon they were really fucking nervous that i was live streaming this big wig and all were not that you can make out what they're saying, but if you were a lip reader, you could totally uh, figure it out. But they were really nervous, and and I wasn't budging. And the guy was there all of like seven, eight minutes, and I live streamed the whole thing, and I even followed the guy out, and then went back to the premiere, and um, you know, and then more or less, I I started interviewing the blogger, and um, it's about twenty minutes in the interview. He was starting to talk about the corruption of the Fredericton, New Brunswick Police Force. 
that's where the capital of this province very fucking corrupt uh, again you know this province is owned by JD Irving they own all the cops they own every fucking thing um, and uh, Howard's Beetlejuice stop fracking now <laughs> Howard <laughs> and um, yeah so the fact that they I think it was I was live streaming the premiere and that big wig which I had every right and I knew they were fucking nervous and it was going to <laughs> uh, you know because someone would figure out who this fucker was um, so the fact that I think it, that precipitated them using this tactic like it's a brand new tactic. they've never used it against me and again I think it was a waste of using this this EMP electromagnetic pulse uh, which was the size of a video camera it was hidden very well whoa we are down if you're watching this in the archives uh, totally totally down disconnected Okay, so we're being jammed, if you're watching this in the archive, big time now. Um, I guess because we're revealing a new tactic that they're using. Um, okay, uh, I can't even type on the live chat. That's how... Um, we are totally down. Is the... Uh, is the Wi-Fi uh, lights on? We got no signal at all. Are the lights on? Because I'm totally down. I got no connection. We're being jammed because we're talking about new RCMP tactics with their electromagnetic pulse. We're totally down. No, no, I got no Wi-Fi signal. None. Uh, we're we're being jammed. This is uh, I've seen this tactic before. Uh, I know. The lights are on. Yeah, you want me to reset? Uh, give me a s yeah. See, the tactic is useless because I, I know that I'm still alive right now. Uh, to, well, if quote unquote, you're watching this in the archives because I've uh, uploaded the master, the local master in this laptop. So you're seeing all this, but right now we're not live. We're, our signal is totally shut down, so we're resetting uh, the network. Um, we're waiting, uh, we're resetting the modem. Uh, yeah, we've been jammed. Um, we've seen this before, but I know what I was talking about, and I'll uh, just, uh, when we're back live, uh, just so that you viewers watching this in the archives will, will uh, know what we're doing. And uh, yeah. We've seen this before. Yawn. It's a useless tactic. It does not work. Because uh, everyone that's restreaming knows that it's me. And they will stick with us. Uh, we're just resetting the Wi-Fi. But we're totally without signal. And the only reason why we're still recording is when, when you start the recording with a signal, even if you're disconnected, uh, all you do is reconnect, or what we're doing now, we're resetting the modem. Um, but, okay.
So it should be coming on in a minute or two. Thank you, Makwa. You're welcome. Yeah, ask Hector if he wants to go on the live stream. Are you, are you playing... Um, Canada People's History is what they're watching okay. right now. We're being restreamed by Occupy Wall Street and a whole bunch of others. and But they know that when we're down, they stick with us. Yeah. We, we always have killer offline content. Plus, I'm going to upload this whole master, so this conversation will be in the archives. Cool. So it's not, it's coming up any moment. Yeah. Yeah, all of a sudden we start getting jammed. So this is either at the ISP, because it's Rogers, yeah. or there's a truck somewhere jamming our signal outside. There was an LV power truck here today. I'm going to take a drive in that case. Yeah. Can I, can I come? Yeah. 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 Or, it's a, here we go. Or there's this, uh, we've been following in the last sort of six, eight months, the NSA has new software that depending on what you're talking about, they go down. So there's different tactics. Yeah. So we're, we're coming back. So there's a live chat comes on. Okay, it's it's coming on. Um, we're depending on what you're talking about. And uh, see, as soon as we started talking about Swin, that's when all this shit happened. And now I was talking about the new NDP tactic. Oh. Now the live stream is uh, So I was talking about the new, uh, the way they zap and fried my batteries on New Brunswick Day in Kokani. Um, Kokan, uh, which was a waste of a tactic. Why utilize a, a brand new tactic? They've never used any police force, they've never, never used an EMP pulse against me to fry my batteries. So to use it, Oh, what the? Okay, we are live from New York. No. Saturday night. No, we're in Elsa Brooklyn. Live. Yar. All right, so we are back. So, yeah, we had to reset the modem. Uh, we went totally fucking down. Uh, we we're talking about the new tactic by the uh, RCMP using the electromagnetic pulse uh, to fire my batteries. Uh, that's one of the reasons why at the People's Social Forum I use the new Ustream Deschanger account uh, for anything in the field like the March and Rally and the Kukums and uh, you know uh, and other, other other things in the field uh, yeah so what a waste of a, a I, I can't emphasize it was a useless waste of a brand new tactic because now I know how to defend against an EMP pulse thanks to Professor X the electrical engineer and RC enthusiast and the co-developer with myself, of our Occupopter. But this time we totally lost signal, but I still kept recording on the local thing, a uh, local master here on the laptop. And after this, I'll just upload the local master. It's a useless tactic. Jamming the signal, as far as I'm concerned, is the most useless tactic they have. When I'm in the field and they jam the signal, Remember, if, you, if they jam your signal for even a second, you lose it, uh, you're no longer live. And all you got to do is just reconnect uh, the signal. I couldn't reconnect that just that last little bit that I was down. We had to actually reset the modem. Uh, but it's a useless tactic because traditionally I might be down for 10, 15 seconds. And I know that when people like Global Rev and Occupy TV and others are restreaming us that we know if we're down for whatever reason they stick with us because they know we'll get back up this one was a little extra lengthier uh which is weird uh so what a waste it's a useless fucking tactic but i tell you what you know i've said this a million times there is no shame in going down it happens to the best of us what is a shame is you don't know that you're down that's why at rallies and marches I still love to use my laptop because the diagnostics here I know when I'm down the one slight problem that I found live streaming from my cell phone my Galaxy S4 on the D Shanger Ustream account um, is it's hard to tell when you're down um, 
you sort of know, but not really. Uh, I find that really hard. Um, you know, I, I the quality. I am shocked that the quality uh, is really bad, up to the standards that I like. Uh, certainly. <clears throat> I like the clean signal here. Uh, the cell phone, it's a lot weaker. I can't not set any, um, because it's a free account, uh, I can't set any uh, bandwidth strength or resolution strength. And the fact that I, I know I'm broadcasting at 16.9, but you, the viewer, get it at 4.3 aspect ratio, you know, the, the screen size, um, I find weird. Um, you know, um, I'm gonna try also the D Shanger and um, and uh, the new .com account, uh, but they're free accounts. So after a month, everything gets wiped off. That's why I've downloaded everything, and we'll put it all here at Occupy Toronto as well. Yeah, so that was a weird uh, takedown again. Like I said, useless. But again, I have suspect that NSA uh, program, it depends on what we're talking about. You know, I'll discuss on my episode 85 of my weekly Shangers how to live stream, even though it took all of August off, uh, more on how to combat electromagnetic pulse. And again, Yar, our forum from Seattle joining us. Um, how to combat electromagnetic pulse in the future. It's actually really simple, but I'll talk further about that uh, this Saturday, this Sunday night at 10 p.m. It's my weekly master class show on how to live stream. Um, and uh, maybe I'll get Professor X on. Um, X on the show. <laughs> not Professor X on. No, no, no. I'll get Professor X on the show um, to talk further about how to deal. It's a brand new tactic. I've never seen it before. Um, no, not foil. Not foil. Uh, it's a special metal. Uh, but, um, but not that. Not just for your laptop, but uh, your... Uh, you got to get a special battery case with this material for all your external batteries. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, so it's, it's, that's a new uh, thing. Um, they've used about, I've been here almost six months now, since March 8th I got here. There, that's the sixth new tactic that the RCMP has used. And what's strange is I now know those are like brand new tactics that I've never seen before, but I know how to combat them now. And this is all a lull in the fracking. We haven't even begun to fight fracking. Once they start the first fucking truck, and they need thousands of trucks, uh, tractor trailer loads uh, to build a fracking well, we're going to hound them at every fucking truck. It's going to take them fucking forever. Um, and uh, so that, you would suspect, is when they would put these new tactics into play, but no. They waste them on a lull. Um, I can't emphasize that enough, because now we know how to fight all these new ones. We have enough experts on our side. and um, Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, I have three or four ways that they could have, when I was just down there, um, Either it's that NSA software that took us down. It's either they're doing it through our ISP here. Uh, they could either be jamming us from somewhere on the street, which I think is a tactic they don't really use much because here in a small place, it, it would stand out like a crowd. Um, you know, they have used drones against us. It could be a drone. I kid, I kid you not. That's one of the new tactics that uh, the RCMP has used against me here during our March for Unity. Um, they have used drones on the October 17th uh, nasty, nasty raid here in El Sabucto last October 17th by the RCMP and stuff. So, um, yeah, that's the one tricky... Of all those six new tactics, uh, we are developing a way to combat 
drones zapping our signal. Um, it because we're here in a you know, and I'm not in a crowded um, rally um, or you know in a march situation. Using a drone is pretty useless in that. Um, you know, uh, just like when they use those sound cannons to jam your signal in a crowd, that's a useless tactic in the ground because they need a direct line of sight. Um, a very useless tactic. Uh, that's why they employ people that have to come almost within six inches to a foot of this laptop. And you know me, I don't give a fuck what I look like, the fact that I'm live streaming rallies and stuff in the field with a laptop. It, it That's just the way I am. I, it, I'm a filmmaker turned live streamer. I need my bells and whistles, right? Um, look at it this way, folks. Certainly a laptop is more powerful than any cell phone around, and certainly a software is more powerful than an app. It is the highest quality live stream you can get today, and I still use a laptop. Um, and uh, I don't give a fuck what I look like, uh, you know, when everyone else is live streaming from a cell phone. What the fucking old guy doing with the laptop? <laughs> Whatever. I don't care. Um, but um, they still, so the tactic in a crowded area is you need people to come within six inches to a foot of this laptop um, to zap your stuff, like DMP pulse to jam your signal. Again, if they jam your signal for even a second, you're no longer live. You have to physically reconnect. That's the trick. But we got strategies to combat that when um, you're uh, um, in a situation like October 17th where you have four or 500 RCMP officers, you know, uh, each live streamer will, will have a few warriors around them. Um, that's how much we need because remember if we were live streaming live on the front line October 17th the RCMP would not have gone as nasty as they did no one was that's why they got as nasty as they did nothing protects people on the ground better than being live and live is the operative word and um, I wish I was here October 17th I wasn't and we'll leave it at that and for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about. On October 17th, uh, RCMP spent five million dollars on one day because the people of Al Sabuktug and others had uh, blockaded all the Swin thumper trucks, which they needed for seismic testing for fracking, for about a five-six week period. And the whole action that day was done to break the blockade and release all the trucks which they did and they spent five million dollars they used four to five hundred RCMP officers last October 17 2013 um, they were using US Army personnel as advisors um, they were using helicopters drones planes not the plural they were using attack dogs they were firing rubber bullets at men women and children they were using pepper spray uh, like they were watering the suburban lawn. They arrested hundreds of people, including the chief and council here. Um, it was a pretty nasty fucking day. Um, and uh, most of those arrests were catch and release just to get them out of there. But it was all a diversionary tactic to release, I don't know how many, uh, thumper trucks. All of them. All that Swin had. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the last, by the way, Junior Bro and Aaron Francis, the last two um, warriors were released. Uh, Junior Bro about three weeks ago and two weeks ago, Aaron Francis. So they're finally out of jail. Uh, they were the last two warriors in jail. Um, they're still s pending some court uh, dates for other people that were charged on that day. Um, and come this October 17th, which is a Friday this year, we're having a special thing at Camp 134 where all this went down. It's on Highway 134, right beside Highway 11, the Trans-Canada Highway. And it's, yeah. Um, Hector Picadou is still holding court there. Um, it's good to see him here last Sunday. It was the first time I met Hector Picadou. He is the ex-national chief of all the Atlantic region. Um, he is a force of nature, um, salt of the earth, one of the great chiefs of Canada. 
um, you know, you just don't get elected the national chief of all the Atlantic region. Um, fighting the good fight. He came by Gopet Lodge last week because uh, there was the also book the powwow, which we live streamed. Um, and uh, last weekend, and he came by because uh, I was cooking up a storm on Sunday. Did a Shanger meat sauce with ground moose and ground beef. Uh, serving penne so at the end of the powwow a lot of people came over and he was one of them and uh, man he had a lot of great stories and I invited him to come to our community meeting here every Wednesday and to come on the live stream right now he's talking to the warrior chief and some others and he will be joining us um, yeah uh, Hector Pictou um, he's Mi'kmaq uh, he's an amazing guy he has numerous stories. Um, we've been having great, great talks. Gopal Lodge here is the new media warrior and community headquarters for all the anti-fracking um, movement here in New Brunswick. Um, it was actually started when we here at Occupy Toronto were invited to um, Elsa Booktug. I got here on March 8th and they started construction on, on this place. Um, they gutted this place and redid everything top to bottom. Um, and I moved in here permanently um, really the third week in April and I've been here ever since. Um, uh, we've been eating so much lobster and crab and uh, uh, yar. D, I'd like to schedule you to have you back live on a show before the end of the year. Yep. Line it up, Hour. I'm there. Let me know. Yar, Hour Forum from Seattle. And, um, yeah, so much crab and uh, snow crab and lobster and moose meat and deer meat and trout, bass, you name it. We've been eating it. Everything but eel like to taste some meal. Um, I remember the first time we were going to have a lobster feast when it was lobster season. Uh, someone asked me, uh, Cher, what's your house record at eating uh, lobster in one sitting? That's like, Pfft. at Toronto lobster prices, one. Really? I said, what's yours? He said, 22. I have a brand new record, uh, three lobsters in one sitting. Uh, with nice hot butter and lemon. Yar. Oh, you, uh, how our forum is going to do a short series of shows on fracking. Yep. Okay, le just let me know, Hour. Yeah, so uh, we great, great place. Uh, and I know I set up the whole internet here. We, we got huge bandwidth, uh, except these rare times that happened earlier where our signal got jammed. Um, yeah, I think, I think it should go hard line um, so it'll be a little harder to do everything because right now I'm on Wi-Fi signal so that gives them a few more options going with a hard line then yeah because um, most people here know that when I'm live that you know they're they're careful not to uh, use up a lot of bandwidth because we live streamers we use a lot of fucking bandwidth and uh, and stuff and uh, yeah um yeah and so we got yeah three new camps we we don't call them blockade camps because really what we're doing here in El Sabokto is we're reclaiming the first nations land so these are reclamation camps we're reclaiming the land and uh, the fact that they happen to be in direct line of uh where all the thousands of trucks needed to build a fracking well uh hey we could put them anywhere we fucking want right and uh yeah so we got eyes 24 7 on these four proposed sites and eyes elsewhere we're not stupid enough just to focus on these four which are public knowledge because we know they have a thousand plus thousands planned uh but publicly, Swin has only announced four. So we got eyes everywhere in this province. And we're getting organized really, really good. Now, I wish 
We can really influence this provincial election coming up, but we're getting organized on that. I know one of the green candidates was here, and I don't know where she went. I invited her here. Um, yeah. We are, we're going to be hosting a few candidates' meetings and uh, getting the vote out. Um, I know a very young woman here from El Sabuktug, a 19-year-old um, raven. Uh, she is running as an independent candidate from here. Um, she was one of the people that came to the People's Social Forum. Uh, we enough time, she likes to walk around barefoot and she's also pregnant, so we did a lot of barefoot and pregnant jokes. Yeah, she's very salt of the earth. Um, and um, yeah, so yesterday she announced she's running, which one great offshoot of that, she's running as independent, um, is a lot of the youth are going to come out to vote as a result. Um, okay, our I got it. Okay, we'll do. We'll start off the show with farting jokes. Okay, Roger that there, our form. <laughs> Seattle out. Yar. Yar. Um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, so any any questions uh, on the live chat? Yeah, and remember in Mi'kmaq, fart is called a big D. If you say big D phonetically, it means fart. Howard, you like the big D? Oh, Howard got me water. Oh, Howard, thank you for giving me water. Howard, Howard, are you in this doll? It is Howard. Is Beetlejuice now? <laughs> is this Beetlejuice that he gave me? Protect the water, folks. Do, 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 do. And Gopit, by the way, pronounced Gobit, means beaver in Mi'kmaq. For the kids, or for the kid in you. Here's Beetlejuice. Hello, my name is Deshanger Beetlejuice. I'm a modern machine director here at Occupy Toronto since day one on October 15, 2011. Big D. <laughs> Fart joke time. <laughs> oh, I already know something about quote unquote beaver. Ew. Hey, put a swing. But, but that, then he's got to take off that nice tile. Howard, how's the water? Do, 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 do. Beetlejuice, protect the water. <laughs> and don't forget, Occupy Toronto live stream sponsor, All Natural Natives from Aqua Sasni Oka. We got this in Gananaque, just south of Montreal, on the way back from Ottawa. <laughs> he does look a lot like me, really. Smoke. Oh. That, no, that's on your nose. No, you can't snort it. <laughs> Yeah. Or if anytime Hector wants to come on the live stream, you can remind him. <laughs> and then your water can go booyah yeah. Busy with John right now. Yes. Beetlejuice. <laughs> Howard gave me this. I don't know where Howard got this. He gets. Howard's the hardest working guy here. I got it from John last night. Ah, he got it from John. From the toy machine. Yeah, I remember, I think it was early June. Beetlejuice, uh, not Beetlejuice, uh, um, um, Forrest Gump happened to be on. I said, Howard, Howard, come here, come here, come here. Watch this. 
he was busy doing something, but he came over and he started watching it and he was glued to that TV. He had never seen Forrest Gump. He loves Forrest Gump now. Howard, this is Beetlejuice, Rise. The bus guy, this is Beetlejuice. Played by, was it, was it Christopher Lloyd? No, Beetlejuice, uh, yeah, Christopher Lloyd played Beetlejuice in uh, Edward Scissorhand, was it? No, all right, that's two different movies. That's right. <laughs> Howard's still waiting on his bus. We still need a bus here, but we're working on a bus in biodiesel. The Gopet Lodge, protect the water that will be on the bus. Yeah, the Mi'kmaq language, it's a very easy language to learn. All new easy, it's so easy. All new easy, Mi'kmaq language, it's so easy. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, so we're waiting on our guests. As we say, like, uh, you know, we're one hour ahead here, but we have a community meeting at 6 p.m. Atlantic. Um, we always have food here. Um, and uh, then at 8 o'clock local time, 7 o'clock Eastern, is when we start the show. And we invite anybody who's here on the live stream. I know I invited Hector Pictou on Sunday. I'm glad he came. But he's holding court. He's talking to the Warrior Chief and others um, in the next room. I'm here in the smoking lounge. Yeah, what a gorgeous view. <gasps> the bus is coming. Howard, the bus is coming. The live chat said the a bus is coming. And we had uh, someone from Hamilton, Ontario here. She's been following us on the live chat. Um, uh, Victoria Ju Julian. Um, she just left for Hamilton today. Uh, she's been here a couple of months. She was quite in tears and going back home, but she says she is coming back. Um, yeah, and, uh, and hopefully soon Lady Zaga will maybe be here, hopefully, you know. We got the teepee all set up out there. The teepee's been set, set up for at least a couple of months now, Za. People have people from New Jersey have come up here with their frack mobile. They stayed here for about three and a half week period. Uh, they slept in the teepee. We have bunk beds downstairs. We have sleeping here. Uh, a lot of people from out of town uh, sleep here. Um, you know, um, yeah. So we're getting so fucking organized. It's not even funny. Um, yeah. Any questions from the live chat? Howard! The live chat says the bus is coming. Have a seat. Lady Zaga says the bus is coming. Howard. Yep. The bus. Mm -hmm. Do you know what to do with the bus? I'll put it right there. He's got a parking spot right there for it. Yeah. We got a pretty big driveway. Mm -hmm. Yar. Hope they're coming now. Yeah. I don't. They, we don't know when. But they say it's coming. Oh, yeah. And we're going to do biodiesel. Yeah. So we pay nothing for uh, the fuel. Yeah. That's going to be a good Gopal Lodge bus. And we'll convert it. We'll have sleeping quarters in there. Uh, I, I like having a pot belly stove in there. The, the single one, you know, the one. Yep. Beetlejuice. Closer to here. Oh, that tickles. Oh, that's a good massage. A little to the left. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> Humor. Yeah. <laughs> He's looking at the lag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yep, and stay tuned uh, this Saturday. Uh, yeah, we mostly last August uh, just took a break from everything. And uh, what's up, Need Up? Our weekly Elsa Book Tug uh, Woman Show is back. Uh, they have a whole, they've been doing a lot of videos, uh, Lorraine Claire and uh, Jane Doe Alsi. So they're, they're going to see uh, their next uh, few weeks. Um, with uh, different uh, things um, as well. Uh, we're going to have the uh, Algonquin Cucums on a lot more regular than normal. Um, Shelly and um, and um, and Eliza Thomas. Um, yeah, they um, I wish I could have stayed there a little longer. Um, we were there about a day and a half. I wish we could have stayed longer, but uh, yeah, it's good that we did live streaming. I'm glad the Kukums invited us up. Yar. And uh, the, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, oh. Howard seen his Migaju out. Kukum in Algonquin means grandmother. In Mi'kmaq, it's called Migaju. Oh, when you finish, okay? Yes. I just finished my dishes. Howard's being a good grandson. Seeing his Migaju down the front steps. Yeah. Everybody knows Howard's bike. It's three-wheeled bike with a nice big basket in the back. <laughs> Drives around also book tug everywhere. Yar. Any questions from the live chat? I also got the live chat from Global Rev on. So if anybody wants to ask anything at the Global Rev live chat, we have that on. And uh, yar. Yar, folks. Yeah, it was good to take a break. I feel very refreshed. It was good going to Ottawa to live stream the People's Social Forum. Yeah, just look it up peoplesocialforum.org. <laughs> He's catching up on the live chat. Uh, the centers, that's what the uh, Global Rev live chat's talking about. <laughs> that's right, Rise. No matter which name they use, the centers, they end up saying the same old bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, it was really nice to uh, see Naomi Klein. I live streamed Naomi Klein uh, once before, back in the old days of Occupy Toronto when we were at St. James Park. But uh, she was a keynote speaker on the first day at the uh, People's Social Forum, and she talked about uh, Toronto's own Naomi Klein. For those that don't know, she wrote The Shock Doctrine and a whole bunch of other amazing, amazing books. Uh, she's got a new book out. It's about climate change and activism and what happened here in Elsa Booktog. Last October 17th is in her book. And, uh, yeah, it was good to live stream her. And uh, uh, Glenn's talking fracking now, eh? <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, so, uh, um, oh, Amy McPherson, eh? Blog Talk Radio, Canadian Glenn. Oh, yeah, she has Amy, journalist Amy McPherson on right now. Hmm. Nice. And they're talking fracking. Yar. How can I chat with them? Fred, while well, I'm live. Go to that link. And go to that link that you posted in. 
Oh, call that number. I should Skype call. Ah, and reading. Summer break is over and we return with a vengeance. That's like us. Ah, there's the phone number. Okay. Uh, I don't have the audio on. I don't have my headphones handy. Uh, okay, so it's just audio only. Okay. But I don't see the live chat. I'm scrolling all the way down. Because uh, I know uh, with, with uh, Punk Boy... He's on. I don't see a live chat uh, below the video screen. I don't see a live chat there, Fred. I've scrolled all the way down. Uh, oh, okay. There it is. That's way below. Um, oh, I see you're there, Fred. Okay. Yeah, and I don't have an account there because uh, I was interviewed by Jay before. And he usually had the Facebook chat on. That's how I communicated with him when he was live. Uh, okay. Yeah, because... Uh, mm. I'm just trying to think out loud here. Mm -hmm. do, 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 do. Fourteen users on the live chat. Mm. No, they got guests, so you don't have to really log in. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here because Hector, I want, I want Hector to talk. Uh, and I would like him to come sooner rather than later, but he's the ex-national chief of the Atlantic region, so... He's on his schedule, and um, he's catching up with a lot of old friends. Yar. Yeah, I should Skype, but uh, let's see here. I need to get my headphone. Yeah, no, I got to. Play that radio show. Hmm. Like, um, boom, 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 boom. Sure. Za, I will, uh, six members of the house, and none of them can be a minister of government or a parliamentary secretary to a minister of government. So it kind of makes it sound like it's outsiders within the House and no more than four members of the entire committee can be of the same party. So I would I have agree to with say... All of that, and I, I definitely support Joyce Murray's bill. It's just that it doesn't go nearly far enough. It What it addresses is oversight of CSEC, but it does not address what CSEC can and cannot do. That's true. That's true. But then that is basically covered every year in the defense bill. So that is similar to the NDAA in the States, but I mean, you know, with 
with what's going on and with Alec now being up here helping write laws. You know, that's, that's you know, it is progress, but yeah, I agree. It's going to be one step at a time. I also see here in our chat to inform you that uh, this show tonight is going out on Livestream.com, Occupy Toronto. So thank you oh, very great. much for doing that. Yeah, thank you very Thanks, much. Guys. Yeah. Some other things that are in the bill in Part 2, there's not to be any extra pay for anybody serving on this committee. So, you know, especially when we're talking about the Harper government, since almost half the entire caucus is making extra cash from either being in cabinet or a parliamentary secretary to a minister or on committees, that may kind of get it across that you're not going to do this just for some coin. And the one that comes to my mind right off the bat is Sleepy Anders, who is on the Committee for Veteran Affairs and couldn't even be bothered to stay awake. He just wanted the extra coin. So maybe she's going to get something across with that. But, I mean, yes, I agree. There is security and confidentiality provisions in the bill. And uh, anybody who does sit on this committee, even when they're done, when they're no longer a member of the Senate or the House, they're not going to be able to tell us what they know. So, no, it's you know, I guess... No, secrecy for life. Yeah. So I, I do understand what you're saying, that, you know, it doesn't really go far enough. But this committee will have powers with this bill that other bodies like Elections Canada don't have, which they should, but they don't. And the mandate is to review the legislative, regulatory, policy, administrative framework for CSEC and other bodies that come in contact with it. And this committee will have the power to summon before it any witness and require them to give evidence orally or in writing under oath, you know, solemn affirmation if they can't be sworn to oath. So, you know, these are things that Elections Canada and a lot of other federal operations should have but of course they don't so you know it she's is, trying to get it in there it's a definite starting place it's a it's a place that we must begin at because at present we have virtually no oversight of CSIS and CSEC there is a single judge with a very very small um, staff to be working on everything that they're doing to try and keep oversight of it all. They can't speak out of school to anyone else that's not right within that industry. So there's there's no public aspect making sure, you know, what's happening in all these gray corners that it's okay and, and we need to have that. Like there, there has to be some mechanism to say this is right or this is wrong and we don't even have that right now. This is true. This is true. There is absolutely nothing right now. So, I mean, yeah, I understand it. And it is a primer, private member's bill. So, I mean, even the chances of it getting even to third reading is pretty slim. There, It is very slim, but it's also not unheard of if there is enough public support. So that's, you know, part of the issue in speaking about it with everyone, to educate them about it, let them know that it exists so they can start talking to their friends. We really need to develop this conversation in the Canadian consciousness. As soon as anybody says seasick or CSIS, everyone just cowers, hides their head, you know, oh, you know, better not talk about that. We don't know anything about it. We're not allowed to know anything about it. It's just, you know, the spooks in the darkness and it can't stay that way. We are a democratic country, <laughs> you know? I agree with that. I mean, there does, there should definitely be accountability and a certain degree of transparency, which, you know, I'm not saying that the little guy from Shawinigan and Paul Martin were any better at it, but uh, it certainly disappeared with Harper. 
And I do agree, that is a very good point, that private members' bills have a much better chance of getting somewhere when constituents are aware of them and they let their representatives know that they are aware of them. That is true. I will agree with that. And the other complicated part about this, um, journalism is the fourth estate. Um, it is a mechanism to keep a democracy in check, to keep politicians in check, and, and to be operating honestly. That's the job of a journalist: is to, you know, be checking what everyone's doing and make sure that it's kosher. Do your investigations when something's fishy and whatnot. But because of the state of things right now, and the attitudes of many current governments, especially the Canadian government. The powers to oppress through CSIS and CSIC and our law enforcement and, and without these regulations about uh, metadata and what's public and what's private on the Internet, it is being used to oppress journalists directly. Indeed so, it is. So the fourth estate has also been hobbled from being able to do its job. So now you have... Um, a very powerful division of government that is answerable to no one, and journalists are not even allowed to do their job to look into things. Yeah, it's not only that, uh, but that is that is totally valid, and you will explain it to us later on in the show. But it's also this corporate media club. You know, we've been hearing about it out of the States somewhat you know there's stuff that the new york times or the washington post has and then they get a phone call well we'd appreciate it if maybe you kept that to yourselves and they cooperate well this happens in canada all the time even worse yes that's what and people don't, don't realize it's even worse yeah and we don't hear about it you know you know people can say what they want about the new york times being a crock of shit now compared to what it used to be, etc. But at least their editorial board actually comes out at some point and, and says that they were requested under <clears throat> national defense to, to squash some information. But, I mean, we don't even hear about it here. And that, that you know, we are behind the Americans, for example, and the British, I would say. And as far as you, if you really want to go out on a limb, we're far behind the Israeli press. I mean, for the longest time, except for maybe the last 10 years, the Israeli press was the freest press that I knew of anywhere in the world for the longest time. You know, so, I mean, it, it can be done. It can be done. It's just, is there a willingness I can give you examples uh, where very established journalists with major productions in Canada have written stories about Canadian intelligence that have been scrubbed from the Internet. I do actually have proof of that. Uh, I believe it. I believe and it. And in the uh, United maybe. States, in the, in the U.S., there is such a, a strong culture behind civil liberties and Canadians were known for being very polite and reasonable and hearing, you know, both sides of things and not getting too fired up, you know, emotionally without all of the logic behind it. And sometimes we look at Americans as being truly driven by emotion. But on this one, they've got us beat hands down. We need that type of fire in Canada to start protecting our civil liberties because we are losing them by the day, especially under this state of surveillance. Yeah, I agree. I, I definitely agree. And, uh, you know, Harper's trying to make this into something similar to the United States with a separate executive branch with the Prime Minister's office and the Privy Council office to an extent. But... He can't do it. It's illegal. It's against the Constitution. I mean, a lot of things that they do are against the Constitution. You know that, certainly. Uh, people are starting to catch on. I mean, when you go 0 and 11 in, in the Supreme Court, it would kind of give a clue to most people that 
maybe you should follow the Constitution once in a while. But, you know, it's, I guess, like you said, uh, I, I got a lot of respect for Joyce Murray. She actually wrote this and got it together and got it on the floor. I mean, that's a lot further than we've come. And Harper's been here for nearly 10 years. So I guess it is a start. But, but do you think that the way to, for 622 to have a real chance... What do you think we have to do as citizens? I think everybody needs to start beating their drums, and very loudly so. There's been next to zero noise about this, so it's not even catching headlines from mainstream media. There's no updates on the progress or conversations that are being had in communities. Uh, We need to break that silence desperately. Um, There are so many different advocacy groups, and the only one that I see speaking out in Canada much is uh, openmedia.ca, and they're doing great work, but they can't do it alone. Joyce Murray can't do it alone. It, it does take the majority of the public to make a decision for our country. So, you know, where are you guys? Hello. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree 100%. I support openmedia.ca. I think they're a fine group, and they're very small. They make an awful lot of noise for the amount of people that are really inside that outfit. And um, I have had them on the show before, too. And they're quite happy to come on, you know, like they they really deserve a lot more exposure for what they do out there in the public realm. And uh, I agree. Any any time we can bring them to light, it's only going to help. Uh, Nadine has mentioned in. The... Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, it just you'll notice that the only publication that really does cover them on a a constant basis is uh, Vice Canada magazine. That's true. That is true as well. I mean, um, that's another thing too. I mean, there are outlets, are there? There are outlets that are distanced from the corporate media. Nadine has mentioned in chat Ricochet, who is still really just getting off the ground. Now, there's a chance, you know, there's a chance. Well, I will also let everybody in on this, and I don't mean offense. We just need to speak really honestly to be able to make progress. So with all of that said, I did meet with the editors of Vice, and they were interested in my story of being surveilled as a journalist and what I was going through um, with the intelligence community. But after we met and they looked at everything, they decided that they didn't have enough resources to take it on, and they had to back away. I also spoke with the editor of Ricochet, and as they're just getting off the ground, um, it's too big for them, too. Because when you're taking wow. on something like this, it's it's the fullest power of the Harper government, and it is the dark corners of it that you're not allowed to know anything about. Yes. Indeed it is. That's too bad. Did uh, did they say anything that, you know, like, we'll be back? Who? Uh, Ricochet like, or Vice? Like, um, like, uh, Ricochet, it, it's, it's just, it's sitting there. Um, when I spoke with Ethan, he said, you know, they were just getting started, and he really hasn't spoken with me much more about it. And hmm. I've seen the direction they're going, and it doesn't seem to be taking on anything about intelligence yet. I imagine they're finding their legs so far, so I have yet to see how that's going to play out. But to start with, they weren't ready to make that big of a bang. And Vice Canada just doesn't have enough resources to go up against the government on this. It, it's because I have so much proof. So this isn't innuendo. Um, or what might be. This is an actual example of how it's being misused. Yes, yes, in- 
indeed. I mean, I know that for a fact. You are a victim of oppression and suppression by the government illegally. And that has to be documented to be provable, and you have that documentation. The next step is getting it out there, right? Correct. And I take an awful lot of flack for doing that, too. Every time I post a new investigation or I start talking about um, the intelligence community and the things that have been happening, I, I get more contact from my watchers. And I got a message from the RCMP just today. You know, I'm, I'm coming on to talk radio with you, and voila, there they are. And there was a, a new media surveillance company scouring my website as well. They're, they're always, you know, just checking on me at the very opportune times so that I know that they're there. But the thing is, is that I haven't backed down. And what I believe is the only thing I can do to protect myself now from what's going on is to make every last bit of it public. Yes, I agree. The, the harder they push, the louder you get. I agree. I agree. Because that's the only thing that will prevent them from, you know, doing something really stupid. Because, because they, they already have. <laughs> yep. Yes. And they are just people doing their jobs, and they want to keep their jobs. So they will not make that fatal mistake that will cost them their career, or their departmental budget. I mean, you know, they're just, they're a different type of bean counter, but they're still bean counters. And they're only worried about their own end at the end of the day. I mean, they're part of the bureaucracy. They just have more power than the rest of the bureaucracy these days, which gives them Unchecked a dark advantage. Unlimited. Yes, indeed. I mean... Just look at the stuff that came out about the CSEC headquarters and the increase in their departmental budget and their staff. It's just like we'll get into with the Canada Pension Plan, with the number of employees of the Canada Pension Plan, how it's shot up through the roof. But everything else has to be cut. We have no money. Well, guess what? You know? Depends what we want done, I guess. There's always money if for I, that. If I recall my numbers correctly, I'm not looking at them firsthand, but I believe it was we had 70 employees within the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, and then when Harper came to power in 2006, he immediately began a privatization process of the CPP, and um, he appointed a whole new board, and they put everything into the stock market, and employees shot up from 70 to 811, I believe it was. Yes, I'm looking at it right now. Those numbers are correct. So, I mean, that is over a 1,000% increase. But yet, you know, we have to control the civil service, and we have, you know, like, give me a break. Give me and a break. And the six budget also went up, even though we're not allowed to know what they do with it, <laughs> what happens, you know, what it's earmarked for, what it's needed for, what the requests are, nothing whatsoever. So their budget went up and the, the CPP Investment Board budget went up for them to do their jobs and everybody else got cut. Public service got cut. The veterans are suffering. Um, senior citizens are suffering. Young children and families. and EI. Not good. Like, the, the yeah. list is nearly endless now. Everything that helped the public is being cut to reinforce the powers of the bureaucracy. I agree. This is not a democratic government that does this. There is no way to explain it away as being one. Indeed. All right. Well, I think we've pretty much gone over C-622, and I agree with you that the best thing for people to do is to read it, find it, look at it, and make noise. And as you said, Open Media CA, I imagine even EFF would have something yep. to say about this. You know, I mean, they are out there. Just and come email on, people. your MPs, please, like crazy. 
you've got to let them know this is an important issue. This does matter because they've got to prioritize their workload too. So whoever's making the, the squeakiest wheel gets oiled the quickest. We need to speak up about this. Yeah, I agree. I mean, even look at uh, C-13 and S-4 when they were trying to just slide them through with not much being said. Then they started to come up, and then C-13 was basically defeated in the Supreme Court before it ever got royal assent. So, I mean, you know, and even that notice, decision. But here's the thing. In the way these things have been defeated to protect Canadian privacy and our constitutional rights, at the end of the day, it has been lawyers who have had to bring that argument for us, again, because the public is being quiet, too quiet. Not to say no one's making noise. Yes, there is some noise. But the ones actually taking real actions, it's come down to us relying on all of our legal community to know better and help us. We've gotten so lazy with slacktivism. You know, most people only see a headline and don't actually bother to read a story or they'll scan it so they, they're not getting the full gist of something and they just, you know, hope somebody else will do it. Well, look what's happened to Canada as we've been behaving this way. This is our fault, too. We've got to take responsibility for that. It is a democracy that requires every voice to participate. We can't just lay down and wait for somebody else. Oh, I agree with that 100%. I mean, anybody who's listened to this show for a while, they'll know how many times I go off about why don't people vote. You know, you can say all you want, that it's a a one day every four years, make an X, go back home, blah, blah, blah. But the bottom line is, if there were 75 or 80% turnout at elections, They would sit up and pay attention because that means people are watching and that's what has to happen. Well, to give people some perspective, since the last federal election, there will be a little better than one million children who have turned 18 and are able to vote in the next election. Those one million 18 to 19 year olds would be able would have been able to affect the election so dramatically that it would have put in a different party, let alone just take away a majority. Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, with all the analytics that have come out, with all the robocall noise and everything else, I mean, Harper got his majority basically with 12,000 votes selectively across the country. That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. There's 12,000 people in Edmonton where I live that could have got off their ass and voted. You know, I mean, I just don't understand it. People have to care. I I agree with that 100%. I think that's probably a, another date on its own to discuss because I do believe that probably the majority of it is protest, personal protest um, without having much outlet to speak otherwise because uh, people aren't really familiar with returning their ballots as opposed to spoiling them. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's definitely some of it. People have just given up caring and, th- and that again plays into everything that's happened in Canada and the slacktivist ideal where we sit on our computers, we click something and we think that's good enough or we sign a petition, we think that's good enough. Uh, in Canada, petitions aren't even legally binding, whereas they are in the States. Yes. Well, I was actually surprised to see that the uh, CEO of uh, the center plate, the guy who was caught on uh, camera kicking in the, the elevator, yeah, kicking the dog, he actually stepped down. So there you go. When, when it's a company where their money's on the line, uh, okay, we'll do something about that. Yeah, but that's these clowns, where social pressure works. Yeah, but these guys who actually control our lives ignore us. And when you're yeah. talking about changing the laws that govern a country, that is um, an entirely different level than dealing with a single employee who can be called a rotten apple and dealt with in that manner. 
But what we're talking about is actual laws that will govern all people. So that's not just going to happen by complaining once or twice. That That's a, a very invested process that we must all care about for it to happen. And if we don't, things are just going to continue on this trajectory so that we have zero privacy whatsoever. And we really don't already, but we're going to get into that in a little bit. All righty. Now, like I said, I think that pretty well closes the, the book on C622. Now, how about we move on to what has happened? Okay, folks. Very so sustainable. So, that was a good um, thing. Uh, we are going to cut away from that. And we're here with Hector Picadou, ex National Chief of the Atlantic Region. Welcome there, Hector. Uh, glad you could uh, be on here. Oh, thank you. You want to tell people a little bit about yourself? Well, <clears throat> yeah, a little bit of an introduction. Um, I held a title of National Chief for the Atlantic Region with the Assembly of First Nations, an organization that I no longer agree with. But um, we sat at the constitutional table with the Prime Minister of Canada, Premiers and Chiefs from across the country on March 15, 16, 1983. And uh, I helped write the book on Treaty and Aboriginal Rights. Uh, one of the, uh, it was all quite outstanding, but one of the most outstanding is that when we sat there, there was no mention of Indigenous women, nor were they on the agenda. So uh, I'm proud to say that uh, now under Section 35.4, it says these rights are guaranteed equally to male and female persons. So that's uh, my... Uh, my contribution to uh, humanity, especially um, Indigenous people and um, and Indigenous women, Mi'kmaq women in particular. Yes, and um, the um, what years did you hold it? And you're Mi'kmaq. Yes, I'm Mi'kmaq, and uh, I'm born and grew up on the Indian Reservation at Eel River Bar, and. Um, the, the years that we sat around the constitutional table was on March 15th and 16th, 1983. It was a, a process that we inherited. The actual meetings uh, in reference to constitution began in 1978, October in fact. And from 1978 until the 2nd to the 5th of November, 1981, there were four. Um, on this November conference, 1981, uh, with the uh, with the work of uh, <clears throat> then Minister uh, uh, Solicitor General of Canada uh, John Crecia had worked out with um, the Attorney General of Ontario R. Roy McMurtry and the Attorney General of Saskatchewan Roy Romano an NDP. They had worked out overnight where that uh, they were going to try to drop. Uh, section 34 from the amending formula, which is land title, and uh, in fact, uh, one First of the First Nations land title. Yes, yes, and in fact, um, the uh, one of the national newspapers. I'd like to say the name, but I won't. <laughs> Don't advertise for anyone. Um, they wrote uh, in their uh, on page seven that uh, this uh, title was the heart and soul of Aboriginal rights. And of course it was dropped by way of uh, the provinces um, at that last constitutional conference under the British North America Act. So that's um, my limited knowledge on that, but um, that's my contribution to um, Indigenous peoples in general. Mm -hmm. And um, let's talk further about uh, treaties, because here in also Booktug, uh, First Nations, um, we're on unceded territory, and uh, most people, uh, I, I know enough of our audience knows what that means, but you've never surrendered these lands, but yet the colonial powers are governing these lands and telling First Nations what to do. Well, the treaties that we have, the Mi'kmaq, that is, um, these treaties, um, the first one that I know of was signed um, 
1725 in Boston, then the Commonwealth. Of, so um, that was the first one that I know of. And uh, of course, uh, these treaties are signed between two sovereigns, you know. Of course, uh, in 1725, um, His Majesty, whoever that might have been, um, you know, was the sovereign over that part of the world. And um, I don't know why it was in Boston that this treaty was signed, but that's the first one that I know of. And then, of course, there was in 1749 and 1752. I remember well um, some of the family members, uh, descendants, of course, of uh, Micmac Grand Chief John Baptiste Coe. He signed the Treaty of 1752. And then, of course, we have the Treaty of 1760, 1761. That one is kind of uh, unique in the way that it mentions uh, Rishi Bhaktu, which is what we call Elisi Buktuk. Uh, which is here. Uh, that's the general area where, um, oh, uh, in Rexton on the 17th of October uh, nine, uh, 2013, that uh, about 800 heavily armed Canada uh, military, U.S. Marine Special Forces that were, who were brought in by SWIN, uh, RCMP uh, tactical unit, um, just heavily, heavily armed men. SQ. SQ of Quebec. Um, well, I, I really didn't know it was the SQ, but because the articles that I read, it just said the RCMP and other police. They didn't name who the other were. But I knew about the Canadian military and I knew about the American Marines, Special Forces. But uh, so our treaties, our treaties were never to surrender land. In fact, the, the next treaty that I would like to mention to you about was signed between the Mi'kmaq and the United States of America. Of course, there was only 13 colonies then. Um, in fact, in October 1775, uh, General Washington actually wrote a letter to the Mi'kmaq Grand Chief and asking if he would come to meet with them in the colony of Massachusetts Bay. And of course, uh, <clears throat> in February of 1776, the Congress from Philadelphia wrote the same kind of letter, making the same kind of requests. And um, in June uh, of 1776, they actually sent, uh, I call it a ship, but it's probably like one of these sailboats, but a big one though, <coughs> and uh, came to pick up the Mi'kmaq uh, delegation, and they landed in where Salem, Massachusetts is now, but of course, again, the colony of Massachusetts Bay. And uh, Washington had sent his best carriages, you know, limousine service. <laughs> I don't know what kind of cars they would have had back then, but they should have been Mercedes or Cadillacs or something like that. <laughs> and um, they brought the uh, Micmac delegation to uh, their meeting spot at a place called Watertown. It's actually Watertown, Mass. today. And there, on July 10th, they met from then till the 19th of July. And uh, on the second day of that meeting, um, Washington uh, asked the Mi'kmaq uh, for proof as to who they were. So they showed Washington and his delegates um, the letter that was sent, the Treaty of 1752, as well as a medallion of George Wash uh, pardon me, King George, George III. And uh, pardon me for making that mistake, but anyhow, <laughs> so uh, Washington was satisfied with the first two pieces of identification, but they uh, said, well, this is the guy that we're going to throw out of here. You know, we don't like this fellow at all. So um, he said, I'm going to get you a real medallion one day. So anyway, um, but the, the treaty that was signed on July the 19th, 1776, again, between sovereign and uh, the Mi'kmaq were the first sovereign people to recognize the independence of the United States of America. So that was uh, the, the treaties with the Mi'kmaq. Mm -hmm. Keep going. We're, we're good. Well, okay. Um, and then um, Washington made a request to, to the Mi'kmaq, and he said that, um, well, um, I want uh, 600 strong men. And, of course, he asked all these different chiefs and sub-chiefs that were with the Grand Chief, and um, how many men have you got? Well, one guy said, I got 20. The other guy says, well, I got 40. And the other chief said, I got 50. And finally, they made up 600 strong men. And, of course, the Mi'kmaq were the first allies uh, uh, to, to go into war against um, the King of England. I think at that time it was King George III, but not positively sure, but quite sure. Um, 
So that's, uh, you know, in the treaty, uh, I can, I'll only cite uh, two spots for you. Uh, one, when, uh, one of the part of the wording says that um, we are now brothers, we now form a long and strong chain, and may Almighty God never suffer that this chain be broken. So, you know, those are pretty strong words, and um, in those days when uh, someone with authority spoke of God, uh, that was uh, the absolute and beyond question. So that was uh, some pretty strong words that they wrote into that treaty. But the Micmac were the first sovereign people to recognize the independence of the United States. And of course, it was all so futile because in 1783, Washington gave them the boot, you know, and all the loyalists came up here and they took our country and nothing was ever said and done about it. So, you know, like... Um, what used to be identified as Nova Scotia, which took in what is today the provinces of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Uh, so New Brunswick, the province of New Brunswick, was actually formed in uh, 1784. So Micmac country was divided up to accommodate the loyalists that were kicked out of uh, what was the United States then. So, um, but um, the challenges of treaties uh, took place uh, by the Micmac Grand Chief, and um, you know, I think it was on the 10th of February, 1927, when then Gra Grand Chief Gabriel Silliboy, uh was convicted in a court in Nova Scotia for having pelts, uh, you know, beaver, muskrat, like that, and um, he was contesting uh, the Treaty of 1752, and of course. Uh, I didn't know Gabriel Silliboy, he was before my time, but um, in those days, uh, Micmacs didn't speak English very well, and um, so uh, I'm sure that they were quite intimidated by the Crown, uh, crown Prosecutor and a judge and things like that. But, um, you know, he, he at least stood up and to defend uh, what he thought was a right, and of course they said um, no. That treaty was signed with the local governor and local chief, and they had no authority, and they don't represent you. Thank you very much. So, you know, and um, besides that, they cited that the Treaty of 1752 uh, wasn't authorized by Parliament. Of course, in 1752 in England, I have serious doubts if they had much of a Parliament. Mm. The first word and the last word of the king was the law. Um, so then again... Um, we're in Alyssa Booktook now, and I'm over at the Gobit House, and uh, people here are really nice, and um, there's uh, so many warm feelings and cohesiveness, you know, here. Um, I'm quite impressed. Uh, we had a little little meeting. Uh, I got here a little bit late, but uh, I participated, though. And um, they, they're... Uh, you know, they're the people who was out on the highway on the 17th of uh, October 2013, you know, uh, contesting, you know, Aboriginal and treaty rights. And um, I, I told them in my little presentation that I sat around the constitutional table with the Prime Minister of Canada, which then was Pierre Trudeau, um, on the 15th, 16th of March, and, um, you know, up until that time, the government of Canada, or maybe I could say the government for the Dominion of Canada, was not open to uh, supporting the Treaty on Aboriginal Rights. In fact, before 1980, then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau made statements publicly that he will not recognize Aboriginal rights. He will not recognize treaty rights. He said, you know, why should we sign treaties among ourselves? And um, so, of course, in those days, uh, in, the, in, in the coming to mid-1970s, the Nishka had a case in the Supreme Court, and that was the first time a court, a Supreme Court has ever upheld Aboriginal rights. Six of the nine judges stated that the Nishka had a title to the land. And of course, uh, Trudeau in his uh, nonchalant cowboy fashion, hands in his pocket, shrugging his shoulders, saying, well, I guess you got more rights than I thought you had. 
So I, I believe that the Nishka, uh, that case, played a big role in uh, what took place with us sitting around the constitutional table on March 15 and 16, 1983. Um, there was lots of um, behind the scenes kind of thing, and of course at that time we weren't uh, absolutely sure who it was, but um, as it turned out, you know, uh, John Critch made it public. Uh, he said, uh, it wasn't me who agreed with the Indian to do that, because John Critch is speaking in his half English, half French kind of thing, and he said, it was Trudeau who agreed with the Indian to do that, not me. So, and of course, uh, that's only the time we realized that John Critch, who had been bragging about this uh, kitchen cabinet, <laughs> which is uh, which is a midnight kind of uh, in back room process, he and the Attorney General of Ontario, which was R. Roy McMurtry, uh, he was a PC, Premier Davis, Bill Davis that time, and of course um, the other Attorney General was uh, Roy Romano, uh, an NDP -er. So it's hard to believe that the NDP now holds about 110 seats in Parliament and um, the NDP um, were very much involved with John Kretsche in, in doing all they could to destroy the Aboriginal people's agenda. So anyway, um, that's how uh, title got dropped though from the amending formula is uh, through uh, the midnight work of John Kretsche and these two attorney generals and uh, who pride themselves and uh, you know uh, even even the word kitchen cabinet was something they took from John Kennedy and uh, in uh, and, um, and and Khrushchev, you know, the Russian leader in the in the 1960s, they just happened to be sitting and standing around someone's kitchen somewhere and drinking tea. And but anyway, so even those words weren't original for John Kretschmer, yeah, but they used them anyway. And so it'd be more like a henchman um, in the back room finding ways to undo constitutional laws, you know what they did would more resemble an act of treason than um, any diplomatic words that anyone might want to attach to what they said and did. And, 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 and the sad thing about it, um, you know, uh, during these constitutional conferences between November the 2nd to the 5th, um, these, uh, this land title was dropped for, for Aboriginal peoples, for Indian people from across the country. And, um, you know, uh, there was lots of scrambling around the National Indian Brotherhood at that time. And, um, of course, you know, Del Riley, who was a good friend of mine, and I like Del, and he was the president of the National Indian Brotherhood. And, of course, uh, a lot of Western chiefs point the finger at him, and uh, they, they forced him to resign. He, he had to take the ultimate responsibility for uh, the, the uh, deletion of the land title. So that's, uh, there was a part of the scramble, but you know, uh, around the 19th of November that same year, 2000, um, year two, uh, 1981, um, they had to save face uh, and they put that word existing in there. So this, if you look at the Treaty on Aboriginal Rights now, they, uh, I think it's section 35.1, I just talk about the existing rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. And uh, so face was saved and um, you know, uh, when we, um, well, of course, from that same conference came uh, sections 37, 1, 2, and 3. And uh, in essence, what it read that, that there would be a constitutional conference one year after patriation. And of course, as you know, that took place on the 17th of April, 1982, when the Prime Minister of Canada, then Pierre Trudeau, and Her Majesty. Uh, out in front of the parliament buildings near that peace internal flame. That's where they signed these proclamations to uh, make Canada a, a sovereign commonwealth country. So, of course, uh, with that section 37, 1, 2, and 3, Pierre Trudeau said there that he will call a constitutional conference one year after. And um, so, of course, um, during that time, the, uh, the National Indian Brotherhood uh, you know, to be a president of the National Indian Brotherhood, uh, you only needed a majority of um, 37 votes, which 19, 19 votes, and you could be the president or the vice president. Now, I'm not sure if that's because of Del Riley being forced out that they changed over, but 
the uh, the whole idea behind the National Indian Brotherhood, anyway, when it was formed in 1968, was to uh, get us ready, get Indians ready for um, constitutional changes. So what they did after Del Riley was forced to resign, they restructured it by making an amendment to the National Indian Brotherhood's constitution and um, so they put in place the Assembly First Nations as, um, but of course NIB is still the secretariat. So uh, that way they said um, all 633 chiefs can vote now, whereas before it was only uh, presidents of the uh, provincial organizations like the Union of the Brunswick Indians, Union of Nova Scotia Indians, and um, that's how it was. And so, of course, uh, they they renamed the, the president of the National Indian Brotherhood. Well, it was now since 1982, April of 1982, that the, um, the AFN became the Assembly of First Nations, and instead of calling their president, the president now, they call him a national chief. And those people who, they were supposed to have seven regional chiefs, and that's how I come on the scene. Uh, they had um, an election, uh, a convention in British Columbia, and I was there, and I got nominated, and I got the endorsement, got support of 80% of the Micmac chiefs from the Atlantic region, including Newfoundland and Restigouche, which is Quebec, and uh, all places in between. Um, I had some good campaign managers, though, and uh, I like to say this because it will acknowledge my good friend um, who lives just down the road from Alicia Booktook now, my good friend Peter J. Barlow. Peter was a Second World War veteran. Of course, he's gone now, but Peter was an extremely good friend of mine, and he was one of my campaign managers. Couldn't go wrong with Peter. And of course, in for the Nova Scotia part of it, my other campaign manager uh, was uh, Mick McGrant Chief um, Donald Marshall. You know, so I couldn't have been in better company for for getting support. You know, and um, that that's how it went. So um, I don't know. There's there's if you if you had some questions, um, I'm I'm willing to answer. And uh, you know, I'm not too good at personal questions, but anything to do with the political thing, like how Canada views, you know, of course, uh, what I said a while ago about John Gretchen and his two attorney generals, I mean, mm -hmm. these these were men dedicated to the destruction of Aboriginal treaty rights, and they still are. I mean, there's no difference between what uh, then Prime Minister John Gretchen did and what the Prime Minister Stephen Harper is doing now. And, uh, in fact, uh, I'm, I'm just so outraged, and I'll share this with you since... Um, I don't know where the <coughs> message is going, but um, maybe... To the world. To the world. Ha! Unfiltered. Wow. Ha, ha, ha. Every word. Oh, wow. Incredible. So let me tell you a little story then. Um, you know, with Stephen Harper, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, he has never had a majority of Canadians supporting him. I'm talking about white Canadians now. Maybe some black and some people of other colors, but certainly the majority of mainstream Canada. I don't think Stephen Harper's ever had more than 33% of people. I mean, it, there was always less than 50% of the people that went out to vote, but even from that, he only got about 33%. So he never really had a majority. First two terms, it was as a minority government. But let me share with you what he did. On October the 12th, 2012, he made public this omnibus legislation. And the omnibus legislation was used to undo treaty and aboriginal rights. In fact, um, the omnibus legislation contained about 14 different laws uh, that are written in Canada's constitutional book. And um, they were undone. Uh, the omnibus legislation comprised of 420 pages, about. And um, I, I don't want to talk about that too much, but I want to tell you about the omnibus legislation, and because it's really horrifying and, and you need to know. Some might tell you that, well, it originated in England in the year 1068, and there's probably some truth to that. But what I want to point out to you is um, the omnibus legislation um, 
1849 was used in the American government in, in, in Washington. And um, at that time, the president of the United States was Zachary Taylor, who was a general in the Union Army for like about 40 years. And um, I don't want to even get into how many thousands of Indians he must have killed, like, you know, Sioux and Cheyenne and going down toward Mexico. So he had to encounter uh, the Comanche and the Apache and, I mean, just an endless amount of Indians killed. But that's not what I want to say to, too much about, the, uh, because I don't know if that had anything to do with the onibus legislation, but I'll tell you what does. That was a compromise on slavery. President of the United States that time owned... Oh, sorry, which act, Omnibus Act were you talking about? The omnibus legislation. Which one? Stephen Harper used that to undo 12 constitutional laws on the 12th of December. What number was it? Do you remember off hand? No, I don't. It, was, it had no what number. Year? It, it, on the 12th of December, 2012. Okay. And um, in that legislation, well, that's where he got it from anyway. And um, so, you know... It was brought to the United States government, Congress, I guess, by a senator named Henry Clay from Kentucky and a, se a senator, um, Daniel Webster from Massachusetts, and it was a compromise on slavery. The president of the United States that time owned a plantation, they owned slaves, and he bought and sold people. I mean, you know, it's hard to believe that Canada, a country that prides itself on being a model democracy in the minds and the eyes of the world, using the same kind of legislation, a compromise on slavery uh, by plantation owners to undo constitutional laws um, in Canada. And these laws, many of them were Aboriginal and treaty rights. And this is just a horrifying nightmare. And um, it's, it's amazing to me that um, when Prime Minister Stephen Harper visits other countries that people don't spit him in the eye. It's probably what he deserves, too. I'm not sure. But to me, um, it's not complimentary to a model democracy when, when uh, a police state mentality using um, laws that were put in place to govern slavery. That's hard to believe. I mean, wow. So, anyway, that's, uh, I could say more, but if there's some questions out yes, there. Yes, Lady Zaga, who we lovingly call our digital elder, she's uh, Inu from uh, Quebec City. Um, she asked a question, G Hector, give us your solution for um, the situation in Asabuktug and what future actions are required. So, Zai, I just asked your question. So oh. give us your solution uh, for the situation in Nassau-Buktug and what future actions are required to help stop fracking. Well, first of all, the everyday people, which is those who showed up the protest, some of those strong women that were there on the 17th of uh, October, well, they have to first realize that in the Atlantic region, chief and council, mostly chiefs and the Indian organizations, did not and do not recognize treaty and Aboriginal rights nor did they participate in the constitutional process in 1983. Once they, they realize this, then they can themselves, because these rights are there, but no thank you to these chiefs in the Atlantic region, all 34 of them. So now, these women, these people in L.C. Booktook, once they realize this, they, they, they'll realize that the rights are there, but not because of these chiefs that they probably believe that put them there. So, this would put the people in, in a sovereign position. These people will have, um, uh, under Section 25A, um, uh, the Royal Proclamation of 1763 was when uh, the King of England, King of France, uh, formally recognized us as a sovereign. And um, many people, some courts, have said that um, this is our Charter of Rights. So we have that, and we have treaty rights as a sovereign. And um, what what um, what needs to be done is they need to be um, used because most of the lawyers that have been involved up to now, they don't know these treaty and Aboriginal rights, and they're just going into courts and um, making plea bargains just like it was um, some local quote Canadian uh, got himself in a little bit of trouble with the law, and uh, he violated some kind of law and. They're going to go to court and uh, work it out that way. 
treating Aboriginal rights is too far over their heads, and and um, they just don't understand that. So, uh, Swin uh, or Swine, whatever it's called, S W N. Swindlers. Swindlers. But it's, <laughs> but I, it's the first S W N time. Resources, Southwestern Energies of Houston, Texas. Of Houston, Texas, but they all they also call it Swin Resource of Canada. That's their Canadian subsidiary, yeah. and they're the fifth largest fracking company in North America. Okay. So you know, uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm seriously regretful that so many Americans. In fact, I can't understand why there's still so many Americans that don't know what state is uh, uh, the next one over to the one they live in. You know, <coughs> so I don't <coughs> expect Swint to know very much about treaties. Um, they know money, and the money is their god, and nothing else. So uh, I would say shame on you, your shareholders, and those executives within Swin. You should realize that we as Micmacs, you invaded us on October the 17, 2013. Shame, shame on you, because we are the first sovereign people to recognize you, your 13 colonies when no one else will. We did, and we produced 600 strong men as Washington wanted. In fact, you are so raggedy ass poor, Swin, keep your minds open if you have one. Yeah. You do not have no shame at all. Washington was so raggedy ass poor, he asked the knickknack, if you have two guns home, bring one. If you have two axes home, bring one. If you got two knives, bring one. We depend on them. And look what you did to us. Mr. Obama, uh, I should say President Obama, shame on you, sir. Shame on you. You know, I listen to American radio stations every night, and some of them are still calling you a nigger. Shame on you, sir. That's not my words, by the way, but that's what they call you. You got Tea Party people are dumping on you every day, and you authorize these Marine Special Forces? Swin brings them here, just like they're in Afghanistan or some place in the Middle East or in some third world country. Shame on you, sir, Swin. So the answer to the question would be, is that um, we either set up our own tribunals or we depend on the goodwill of still some fair and reasonable people there in white society. But Swin, shame on you. Money, money, money. I hope you drown in it. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, and now um, on Sunday we were talking about the, the white paper and you were given a brief history of the 19... 69 white paper which you know most people say that it was um, what the name on it is Jean Crochan uh, want to talk about the white paper of 1969 and a bit of the history uh, Aye, sure of that sure well um, I, I, I believe that the 1969 white paper policy was actually the 100 year anniversary of federal Indian policy, first in the Dominion of Canada, but now Canada. The origin of the uh, of this uh, 1969 white paper policy was actually a policy laws that was put in place by Her Majesty Queen Victoria, and she put in place, and her governors, of course, put in place the 1857 Extinguishment Act, where I believe. And the way I read it was that uh, the gun and the bullet was the Indian policy. And of course, at that time, that was international. Because in 1857, there was no Canada. There was no dominion of Canada. It was a colony owned and governed by Her Majesty. So that's a shame. And of course, we know now that on July 1st, 17, uh, 1867, then John A. Macdonald, put in place um, the Dominion of Canada. His first order of business was to put in place the 1869 Extinguishment Act. Again, the gun and the bullet was their federal Indian policy. So that's why I believe that, you know, what John Chrétien and then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, what they did was just, you know, uh, I'm almost tempted to say that you know, they were so boldly arrogant and racist that they were ready to put in place the 1969 Extinguishment Act. But instead they call it the 1969 White Paper. But then again, it was on assimilation anyway. So, um, 
you know, to give you a little perspective on the Prime Ministers of Canada, in 1943, at the height of the Second World War, um, then Prime Minister for the Dominion of Canada, Mackenzie King, he said in the House of Commons, in Parliament, that in 25 years there'll be no such thing as Indians in Canada. And um, it's hard to believe, I mean, my mother had two youngest brothers were, were someplace in Europe in the trenches fighting, and as well as lots of lots and lots of indigenous peoples. Of course, we were called Indians because of the Indian Act, but still, these men were, were in the trenches, and yet the Prime Minister of Canada, Mackenzie King, could make such a statement in, in the House of Commons. That's awful. So from 1943 to 1968, that's 25 years. And then, of course, it was Pierre Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, uh, the head of the Liberal government. So that's, uh, that's pretty much, um, you know, I could probably tell you that Indians from across the country, uh, through the National Indian Brotherhood, were all riled up and all waving their verbal tomahawk, pounding their chests, you know. Many people totally admire men like Harold Cardinal, you know, um, lots of Cree from Western Canada. Uh, and, and before long, they all became card-carrying liberals. <laughs> so they joined the Liberal Party of Canada, you know. So, you know, when we were sitting around the constitutional table in 1983, then President of the Federation of Saskatchewan Indians, Sol Sanderson, was actually the Vice President of the Liberal Party of Canada, if you can imagine that. Then Minister of Indian Affairs, John Monroe, was his good buddy. I mean, they did that, of course, uh, to undo our constitutional process. And uh, the, the Government of Canada, although they're smiling at the world, they were doing the best they could in the back rooms, using millions and millions and millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, to, to win these guys over, to undo uh, and to destroy the uh, Aboriginal people's constitutional agenda on March 15, 16, 1983, in 1984, 1985. In fact, the last one took place on the 27th and 28th of March, 1987. And so, you know, those of you who view Canada as a model of democracy, think again. I mean, what these men did is an act of treason and uh, no one said and does a word, say a word about it. So I, I, I totally come, come to admire some of the people who in the Lissy Booktook area out in Rexton on the highway that day. I, I, I read a, a, an article where a Micmac man named Louis Jerome actually said what's happening here today is an act of treason. He's got it right. He's got it right, really right. And um, one of the Micmac women, again, a woman who I call my hero now, uh, Sue Patless, she, she cited um, an eviction that was uh, used in 1778. You know, they had the right words. They had the right idea. And, uh, you know, we were subject uh, to a police state mentality. And um, some of these men who identify themselves as chiefs claim to know nothing about it. It just happened, but that's not true. You know, um, I, I read uh, on the 14th of November 2013 that these chiefs had, had already signed agreements with Swin two years before that. So that would take you back to 2011. And um, yet they said they knew nothing about what took place on the 17th of October 2013. I would have to say it's a crock of bull right to the rim, you know. And uh, if we weren't on, uh, on uh, uh, uncensored uh, media or social media, I probably would, or if I was half drunk too, I think I'd probably use a few choice F words to describe them. But I don't usually do things like that, nor will I do it now. But those who do... Uh, should look at Canada and these men who claim to represent us like um, the um, the Assembly First Nations NIB in office like Sean Atlio, the Roger Augustines you know shame on you if they if they have any shame you know the um, 
the, the, the Assembly of First Nations Chiefs of New Brunswick, chaired by uh, Chief George Ginnish. Well, he's not a chief, really. Board of Director George Ginnish. And um, I don't know the woman's name. Quote chair from Toby. Just a female chief, you know. Don't know her at all. But, you know, these people, you know, um, they would have to be lying when they said they knew nothing about that. When, in fact, three of the contracts that were signed, one of them was through Swain and the government of New Brunswick, and it wasn't for consultations from chief to chief. So if, they're, if they say they know nothing about that, that's not true. And then, of course, one of the contracts was signed, a contract that, uh, a subcontract from ISL, which is Industrial Security. And Industrial Security is owned by Irving, and Irving was contracted from Swin. And Swin, they actually hired six people uh, through the North Shore Micmac District Council. And I think they hired nine through the Assembly of First Nations Chiefs in New Brunswick, incorporated, I should say, which means that they're corporate bosses. And um, so this is 15, 15 people that they hired. And this has got to do with security. So they, these are men and women that we see every day at the Indian Res. There's some of them are our brothers and some of them are our sisters, literally, you know. And yet for money, they do things like that. So, you know shame on you you know um you know when when i i when i hear and read uh, george guinness uh, the ill ground guy claims to be chief making statements like uh well we got to protect our treaty rights i don't even know if he knows how to spell the word treaty in fact in 1983 <laughs> in 1983 actually um there's a resolution that was passed by the Union of the Brunswick Indians, written by none other than Graydon Nicholas, the same man as the Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick now, making a statement. He said, and the third word as he said, the Union of the Brunswick Indians chiefs will not participate in the constitutional conferences on March 15, 16, 1983. They will not. In fact, in the uh, sixth word as, it has five parts, so I'll give you part four. It says that we inform the federal and provincial governments of our decision that we will not participate in the constitutional conferences of March 15, 16, 1983. So they're officially on record in New Brunswick and in Canada that they do not support treaty and Aboriginal rights. So when you have the the new chief here in Melissa Buktuk saying that he has a treaty right, well, shame on you, boy. And, um, of course, George Guinness is saying the same thing. They have no treaty rights. Formally, the Atlantic region is on record of not supporting the treaty rights process. That includes the Union of Nova Scotia Indians. The guy who made statements to the uh, then opposition party of Nova Scotia, his name was um, Alex Christmas. He was then president of the Union of Nova Scotia Indians, and of course he was also chief of the member two Indian res. And uh, he, he used to... Uh, do a lot of heavy uh, talking with a, a local MLA from Sydney. His name was McLean, but I forgot his first name now. And stating, uh, rah, 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 we're going to be involved in that, and don't include us in that. We want you to speak against that. So, you know, they have no treaty rights. And of course, you know, uh, but here in the province of New Brunswick, we have um, none other than uh, David Allworth, the Premier of New Brunswick, uh, when he first took uh, office, he, he gave himself uh, the title of Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. And, um, you know, I, I like to tell people that um, he's standing there holding a smoking gun in his hand. And I mean that quite literally. You know, he's responsible for what took place on uh, in, in Rexton area. I mean, 800 heavily armed military came here with the intent to kill. That is serious, serious. This is third world. Maybe we could read about that in maybe some place in the Middle East or some other third world country, but not here. But it did happen here. You know, then we have, then we have um, David Allworth, the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. He's so ashamed of his title now, you hardly ever see him identify himself to the media as a cabinet minister holding the seat of the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. I uh, never knew he had any shame, but maybe he does have a little. And um, 
you know what he does? He hires Phil Fontaine. Phil Fontaine is a board of director to Royal Bank of Canada, RBC. Shame on you, RBC. Shame on you, holders. Shame on you. That's an awful, awful thing. And then he hires Roger Augustine as his other um, advisor. He hires his other professor uh, named Coates. He, he used to be at the UNB in St. John, but I think he, he moved to um, University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. But he's also one of um, the other advisors to, um, to David Allward. So, you know, and of course, David Allward, members of his parliament, or his cabinet, I should say, like Craig Leonard, he's actually formed a consulting firm with uh, Stuart Paul, Roger Augustine, and those types of guys. I mean, they call it sweetgrass or something like that. Shame, shame, shame on you. And I mean, this is collusion, big time, you know, men enriching themselves. And, um, you know, and I'd like to say maybe one more word about uh, Premier David Allward. Yeah. David Allward actually worked for the Tobik Ban office before he became the premier of New Brunswick. So if there isn't collusion there, then you would have to tell me, remind me what collusion is. Where's Tobik? Um, Tobik is um, Tobik's the located um, in, near Perth Andover, New Brunswick. It's like um, it's about uh, 60 miles from the town of Woodstock, going toward Edmonston. Mm. And that's where David... He's, is he a lawyer? Uh, Allward? Well, he claimed... No, I don't think he is. But, he, but I really don't know. As far as I know, D he, David Allward has, um, he has a PhD in theology. So he's, a, he's <coughs> probably a Klansman too. I don't know. Because, I mean, that's the right criteria. Um, no, he, he has, he, his father's a clergyman. That's, uh, I know that. And, and, of course, I know he has, he has a master's degree in theology. But other than that, I don't know. Don't know the guy. <coughs> but um, you know, we um, we are quite sympathetic uh, about um, the heavy hand. But that's not unusual, though, um, <coughs> for what what governments of Canada and how they dealt with uh, Indigenous peoples, Mi'kmaq people, and um, you know, anyone who disagrees, they smear you as a, a radical militant, um, anti-fracking, I mean, come on, you know? We had fathers and uncles and brothers and people like that who were in two world wars, so that we can have our little spot under the sun. We should be able to disagree with big government, David Allwert or the Craig Leonard or any one of them, uh, in the same manner they disagree with the liberals. In fact, I, I understand they use those F words there and challenge this guy to come out behind the building in the parking lot and I'll put knuckles to you, you know? Hmm. So we should be able to disagree with them in the same fashion that they disagree with liberals without having those labels anti-fracking attached to us. Using military machine guns come here to kill? Shame on you, if you have any. You know, we... It's hard to believe that there's constitutional laws in this country. You know, sometimes I feel so ashamed when I when I meet with uh, Mi'kmaq women, indigenous women, and I say, well, you know, what we did for you on March 15th, 16th, 1983, is that we literally lifted you from the pits of hell and we elevated you. You're now within the circles of the gods. And, and, and I, I say that to them, but it's hard to believe that's true, but it is. But when you when you see um, uh, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, David Allward, Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick, the Governor General of Canada, authorizing military force, heavily, heavily armed men, say nothing about the high technology that was used for surveillance. Probably had some drones here too. So drones, helicopter, planes, all plural. Yeah. Because the RCMP do own drones. Plus, yeah. you had the U.S. military <coughs> advisors on that day. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I was told there was Marine Special Forces brought in by Swin, you know, like they would if they were going over to Africa someplace or someplace in Afghanistan and places like that. But, hey, I mean, here? Wow. Hard to believe. So, anyway, I'm going to shut up for a little while, and if someone has a question, I'll be pleased to answer it.
Yeah, Lady Zaga was calling uh, Allward. He's probably a master sn snake oil salesman. <laughs> <laughs> Tell her she forgot to add on that it might be a Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. Yeah, they, the, the military force is just like what uh, Lady Zaga was saying, uh, the G20 in uh, Toronto in June of 2010. It was insane. Uh, yeah, it was, it was all needless. Uh, you know, I like to always describe October 17th as, you know, what do you call when the government six its own police force against its own people to protect the rights of a foreign company? That's treason in anyone's books. You know, with all the major free trade deals going on, like TPP, the Pacific Rim free trade deal, uh, FIPA, the Canada... China free trade deal, there's CETA, the Canada European Union one, there's, uh, I forget what it's called, the Atlantic Rim free trade deal, all these free trade deals, it's it's insanity, it's capitalism run amok where the number one principle <coughs> guiding all these is the protection of the future profits of that corporation. Uh, any disputes are settled with a special secret tribunal uh, made up of corporate lawyers working for these corporations, they're judging you. None of those decisions are made public so that, for example, if you're protesting and blockading, uh, they could take you to these secret tribunals uh, because you disrupted their future profits. As to what that is, they can make up whatever. Um, other things in these free trade deals, heavy, heavy censorship of the internet. Because we civilian journalists, people are waking up with what we're doing here. Um, the sword and shield of civilian journalism is always the live stream. Um, they're going to heavily censor the internet. It's going to be hard for us to even get a signal to live stream. Uh, um, deregulation of Wall Street and stock exchange is 100%. Uh, it is fucking insane. Uh, so if a local government, for example, makes a law, environmental law, which cuts into the future profits, then, then they can get sued. Um, it, it's just insane uh, what is coming down the pipe and uh, treaty rights. What's that? You know, uh, that cuts into their future profits. Uh, there's a lot of insanity going on, and it's by legislative of, um, authority. Um, well, any comments on that? Yeah. Well, you know, um, these these um, treaty and Aboriginal rights are written in. It used to be. Like I said a while ago, when Gabriel Silliboy, Grand Chief of the Micmac, had gone to court in 1927, they said, well, yes, you do have that, and it's there, but it was only done by the local governor and, uh, and the local chief, and it hasn't uh, met the uh, requirements uh, of, um, in Parliament. Well, they can't say that no more. Because on the 22nd of November, 1985, James Simon shot a deer in a farmer's field, and he, his case ended up in the Supreme Court. That was the first Supreme Court ruling that Micmacs have ever won. Up until the time we put in place the Treaty on Aboriginal Rights, no Micmac has ever won a case in the courts. In fact, in 1957, right here in Illisi Buktuk, there was a man named Anthony Francis. I don't know if he was a chief, but certainly um, he took two cases, uh, treaties to court. One was the Treaty of 1752 for fishing right out here in, uh, in the Rishibuktu River. And the other one was um, the Jay Treaty. Of course, the Jay Treaty was signed in England in uh, 1794 between England and the United States. At that time, the ambassador was a man named John Jay. Most people think the Jay Treaty was was an Indian guy, but he wasn't, you know. But he was a quite an intellectual kind of guy, uh, very loyal to His Majesty, and somehow uh, in 1776 he sided with Washington and the Patriots, you know. But it was him who put that treaty in place. So these are their laws, you know. One of the things that I I I am always a little bit reluctant to say this because I don't want people to believe that, you know, uh, Trudeau, Pierre Trudeau was my hero. But I always want to uh, say this because these people wouldn't know a word that I'm saying unless I mention Pierre Trudeau. So I will again. In 1983, 
when we took a break from sitting around the constitutional table, Trudeau used to go to that side and, and the media would, would crowd around him, lots of microphones and things like that. And this is what Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau said. And he said that this is the first time in history of civilization that a civil government sat at the constitutional table with our Aboriginal peoples with the intent of recognizing their rights, their treaty and Aboriginal rights. He said, this has never been done before. He said, um, uh, this, will, this will distinguish Canada from all other countries of the world, including third world. So I would like to point a finger uh, at uh, then Prime Minister John Chrétien, now Prime Minister uh, Stephen Harper third world, third world, third world. You know, and um, I'm beginning to believe that Stephen Harper knows nothing about anything. He's there and he doesn't run a damn thing. He goes, sits there, looks important, and um, the, the, his office is run by the Privy Council. His, his office is run by the PMO, and he's just a dumb white guy who knows nothing. He got elected in Alberta, in Calgary somewhere, and um, he become an MLA. Then he gets the, elected to be the leader of the Conservative Party. And I might add, the Alliance Party. The Alliance Party in Europe was known as the Neo-Nazi Party. Then the Reform Party with Preston Manning, another Nazi. And then, of course, um, to give it some legitimacy, he, he adopted the Progressive Conservative Party, and they called themselves the Conservatives, you know? So they combined themselves of Nazis with the Alliance. That's, that's what I read in McLean's magazine, anyway, about the Alliance uh, in, in Europe, in Germany, in fact. They're known as neo-Nazis. Neo so there's no compliment to the Conservative Party. And I'm not saying this to, to give you a belief that I'm a good liberal leader, because we don't have a friend in on Parliament. I used to believe that maybe the NDP or, or the Liberal Party, but I've seen them all. In, in fact, when, 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 when the women, when women's rights were under attack by Stephen Harper, and that government has a good reputation for fighting powerful women, they took on the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Beverly McLaughlin, and a man, uh, Morris Delcott, who was the member of parliament from some place in Saskatchewan, he holds a PhD in theology. And he said, a, he made a claim publicly that the uh, Beverly McLaughlin, then Chief Justice, well, she is still, of the Supreme Court of Canada, said that she has godlike powers. And she was furious, and she took him on, and she said, you show me where and when I said that I have godlike powers. And she forced him out of a cabinet seat, and I don't think he's held one since. But the truth is, he said that about her because she had given, she, she's the chair of the uh, Order of Canada, and they actually gave Henry Morgenthaler uh, an, a, a distinguished award from, as an Order of Canada. And of course, as we, we all know, uh, Henry Morgenthaler, in, in, it's in reference to abortions, you know. I'm not saying it's good, and I'm not saying it's bad. If that's what a woman chose to do, well, let her do it. And um, so then, of course, we have um, we have Stephen Harper with Bill C-21. He says to indigenous women across the country, he said, well, he said, what we're going to do is that we're going to amend the, um, the uh, Human Rights Act, Section 67, so that we can give you rights, so that you will not lose land when, the, when you divorce uh, someone at the Indian Res. We're going to give you that, so you'll have protection under the Human Rights Act. They can't do a damn thing for indigenous women, because the indigenous women have never, never been more powerful under Section 35.4. They have never held so much power since the time Jacques Cartier set foot on the Agaspe. So to, to, to tamper with these rights, they're, they're degrading women, not, not protecting them. You know, if you want to protect them, let him call an inquiry about all his murdered and, and, and missing Aboriginal women. Let him do that. He wouldn't do it because he said it's a, it's a social thing. It's not, it doesn't require, it's just federal Indian policy that's doing that. You know, women are powerful and men are intimidated by them. Men like him, like Stephen Harper, they're intimidated by women like that. And, and uh, so when you go to places like Alberta and Saskatchewan where they have penitentiaries for women, 80% of the inmates are fe uh, female inmates are indigenous women. 
hard to believe and sad, really sad. So, you know, Canada, Canada's policies um, leave a lot to be desired. In fact, I would say that what the um, Emergency Management Act that Stephen Harper put in place, he created a police state that Indian reservations across Canada. You know, we don't even know who the police are here. You know, you go to the band offices or the health, child and family services office. I'm firmly convinced that the child and family services office at any and all Indian reserves are, are the headquarters for the espionage. There they compile all the data. Uh, what do you call that? Racial profiling? Yeah. That's how they do it. And uh, most, of the, most of the people there, there's some Micmac women working there, it's maybe some men, but most of the directors are non-Indian or white, French, whatever. And um, so, you know, the laws that we have in Canada uh, written into their book means nothing. In fact, this book is, means a lot less. It's a lesser a book. And these men doing are doing everything they can to remove these sections. Lady Zaga says we should kick them out of the territory, close them down. How do we do that? Uh, she she has to lend me a few bucks. I'll show her how to do it. Hey, lady, she's our digital elder, man. Right? <laughs> you don't mess with Lady Zaga. <laughs> <laughs> tell her, tell her, tell her, call Leona or Google lock in, and she'll do it. <laughs> how <Yeah>. much? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just joking with you, man. But you know, uh, you know. Uh, Stephen Harper used uh, Leona Gokalak, if I'm pronouncing her name right. I don't mean nothing bad by it if I'm not pronouncing it right. But she actually took pride in undoing a treaty right from health care. You know, I thought John Crecia was the ugliest monster that ever lived, you know. In 1998, he was his health minister at that time was a woman named Diana Marlowe. She actually went to Western Canada where Indians told her that we our health care is a treaty right. And she refused uh, that, and she turned back, and she went back to Ottawa and refused to talk to them on that. So when I see an Inuit woman like Leona Gugalak uh, do, doing the same thing in British Columbia to undo health, not with a chief either, with with two corporations. And I think was that guy Douglas Kelly. I mean, you know, this man is hard to believe. I would have I would have to believe that he's a first class racist. He looks like a traditional Indian, but. He might, he might be Uncle Tom, for all I know. <laughs> yes. Oh, we have Sunday from Santa Rosa, California, just outside of uh, San Fran. Just joining us, ER. I, I hate to say so too, Hector, white inside, Lady Zaga says. Uh, you're a good woman. She's our digital elder. Since day one, almost three years ago, on this live stream channel. Well, let me tell you a little something. Um, how do you? What's her name? Lady Zaga. Lady Zaga. Lady Zaga. Go for it, she said. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I lived in Ontario, and I had some Inuit female friends, and I liked them a lot. They were good people. So I was quite impressed when we sat around the constitutional table in 1983 and 1984. I felt that the Inuit were the most well-organized people sitting around that table. Whether they were or not, I don't know, but they looked to be highly organized and the best well-organized. I would say Indians ourselves were the worst organized. Métis were okay, uh, as well as the non-status Indians. But, you know, the thing that I wondered about the Inuit, I believed after that they were going around the wrong road. I felt that they wanted to be equal to white society. And it isn't a bad thing if that's what they wanted. They wanted the corner stores. They wanted the local gas station. They wanted the local pizza hut or something like that. And now in the north, you have mayors ahead of towns, not chiefs, not grand councils, but mayors and town councils. So how do you feel about that? She says they wanted the skills. I could have showed them to you without doing that. There's highest suicide rates in the world among the Indian Inuit people. That's not a good thing. 
why would you why don't you want your own identity you survived the north bitter bitter cold now your land is wasting away you know it's low self-worth she says i know but you know but still i i i totally admire the inuit people you know Lady Gogola? Zaga. Zaga, sorry. <laughs> you know, uh, I, oh. I'm sorry. Uh, Your new nicknames are. Uh. I'm not very good at <laughs> those kinds of things, but you know, um, <laughs> up until 1983, would have maybe a little, little bit of a mention somewhere along the way. Inuit people were still called Eskimos. They had no recognition as Aboriginal people and they were excluded from the Indian Act. For all these years, you were nobodies. You know, it would appear to me that as of 1983, when some of these honorable men who represented you, I remember this guy, Gordon, uh, um, <laughs> I, I, I used to know his name all the time, but now I can't remember none. I want to take, um, want to tell you about it I can't but they 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 were well intended I really believe that you know and uh, but I still can't understand um, why you would want to be equal to white society look at the conditions that you're in now her territory is from near Quebec City but now she lives in Toronto <laughs> oh. but um, we um, you live in Toronto. You 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 should you should put us. Sagani, Chikudimi. Chikudimi. Yeah, yeah. I've been there. You you should put us in contact with some of your um, your good supporters, and uh, we'll work something out and make make the North a better place to live. We'll bring the women there from um, Elisi Buktuk. They're powerful. They can give you the right road. Yar. I don't know what I don't know what else to say. If she has a good question to me, I'll answer. Zad, do you have any more questions for Hector? Hector, you can stay here. I know I was offered that before, but yeah, you stayed here Sunday night. Talk more about that meeting. Just holding the fridge. Talk to yourself. What meeting? In 1983. She wants to know? Yeah. When the Inuit were finally at the table. Well. The constitutional one. Um, I, I can't remember his name right now, but he's a senator. And um, he's an Inuit guy. And I used to know, I met him a few times. and um, You said Gordon something? No, that was Gordon. Uh, Gordon was just the uh, president of the Inuit Association, Tapestrat of Canada or something like that, you know. I, um, I'll remember his name in a minute, but the other guy was, um, he was a senator appointed by Pierre Trudeau. You know, of course, in those times, I don't know if she remembers that, but in back of a, I don't know, it was a $20 bill, it was a picture of the Inuit people there, you know. Um, that's what, that's all I know. Um, but, but they I, weren't traditionally no. part of the Indian Act. No, they weren't. And nor would they had any recognition at all. Constitutional treaties, nothing. Big zero. But if I could remember the names of those men, I should be able to tell you more. But, um, and uh, I can picture them in my mind, but I can't, um, I can't remember their, their last names. And, when I can't remember the last names, it's not easy for me to talk about them. But let me tell you, I don't know how the Inuit got to be at the constitutional table, but I kind of think that they had Trudeau's ear, though. They were like this guy who was appointed a senator. He was a good card-carrying liberal. And that shouldn't be the criteria to get recognized. The, re the, the recognition should come from a, 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 a people, not for who you're loyal to. In this case, the senator was loyal, card-carrying liberal. And um, Gordon Takuna, Takuna, yeah, Takuna. I remember his name now. And, um, you know, they were so, they spoke so well, and they just had all the right words to say. And they said them well. So, you know, 
but I didn't know that you wanted to have your own, well actually I'll tell you the truth, I believe that John Chrétien did what he did in Nunavut because he didn't want Quebec to have that. Because if Quebec would have, ex would have become sovereign, you know, that would have been theirs. And I'm sincerely convinced that John Cratchit didn't want that at all. Because, I mean, they, they became a territory in 1999. So, so I, I really don't know much about that. And, um, but I, I, I just can tell you that from the Inuit that I've seen there, um, they made a good impression on me as being sincere. And, um, and you were saying the most organized. They were the most organized. Well, well organized. In fact, I'll tell you, ma'am, I'm so impressed with the Inuit today. About three years ago, I met this Inuit woman. And at first, when I saw her at a laundromat in the city somewhere, I thought she might have been maybe from Asia somewhere. So I had to ask her if she was an Aboriginal woman. And she said, yes, I'm Inuit. So I, I, I knew that you have an extremely nice writing system. So I started to ask her about that. And we spent maybe two hours talking about that unique writing system. She told me that she's not known that since I was a little girl, my mother taught me how to do that. And, and it's just remarkable. She could write anything. You know, if I told her an English word, it would just, within 10 seconds, she would write it out for me and using the Indian Inuit syllabics, you know, so uh, I'm, I'm quite impressed even now with the Inuit, although I've become uh, sympathizers, you know, for the living conditions that you have because, you know, most of the young people in the north now, like they do here, we have no identity because we're governed by federal Indian policy, whereas you, the Inuit, you agreed to federal Indian policy on assimilation, not us, you know, <coughs> because when we sat when we sat around the table in 1983 um, against the will of bold and arrogant, maybe racist provincial premiers, and um, you know, we didn't want to be French, we didn't want to be English. Good night, guys. Thank Good night. you. Good night, John. We, we, we wanted our own identity, and that's Thanks what we got. Down there. <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you. I'm looking forward to uh, helping you out some way. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Warrior G, John Levi. Yeah. So, the, uh, you know, like, we we did what we did, but I think the government of Canada had its own mind made up as to what the outcome of all that would be. And um, all these things that we did in 1983 and 84 are under attack now. And um, the attack comes from... Uh, federal government using Indian organizations like the AFN and its members. I mean, I seen a, I seen a, a write-up on a, a man from Ontario called John Bukage says he's the Grand Chief responsible for 42 Indian reservations. And he was talking about removing that word Aboriginal in exchange for First Nations. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we sit around the constitutional table, you know, we didn't have any any um, uh, panels of uh, constitutional lawyers available to us. We just did the best with what we had and what we knew. And, um, you know, First Nations is not a constitutionally recognized word. And because it isn't, it doesn't mean it's not valid. But, you know... The, good night. Good night. Good night, Christine. Sleep well, guys. Thank you. Yar. Either you can sleep on the couch or downstairs. Yeah, couch probably. Yeah. Or there's, there's a room with two beds in it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Empty. Thank okay. you. And um, you know these um, these men uh, have only one thing in mind, and that's total assimilation. Now, we didn't know that. We just thought that governments work in good faith. You know, I, I sincerely believe now we live in a police state. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, if we protest, we're called radicals and militants and, you know, 
So uh, I really don't know what to say, but. Well, uh, Lady Zaga has a question about, she wants to know about the steps for the current legal situation in Elsa Booktooks. What's the proper resources? You know, uh, what's the process? Um, you know, um, well, I'll, I'll like the treaties did, the friendship treaties in the 1700s, they did call for a separate court system as well. Well, because right now we're dealing with all the actions of last year and all the charges are, we're dealing with the colonial courts, uh, which is, that's not the remedy. Um, so that's her question. She wants to know the steps for the current legal situation in Elsa Booktug. What's the proper resources? Legal advisors? And drop names, Hector. <laughs> well, uh, I'll tell you, it's like this. There's still f by far too many people who believe, uh, well, make an assumption that the treaty rights are there and are there for them. They need to first realize that formally, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, chiefs of the Atlantic region have formally told governments that they do not recognize the treaty process. They need to first recognize that. Then they have to realize that they have to do something else, which means move away from their, quote, leadership, because they are the Indian agents, plus some other titles that I wouldn't want to get into right now. And then, only then, that uh, the treaties can work for these people, because they didn't know what these, quote, chiefs did, Union of the Brunswick Indians, Union of Nova Scotia Indians, because if they didn't know that they didn't recognize these processes, then, but the treaties are still there. And, you know, these chiefs are talking about being consulted or not being consulted. Well, they never told the people anything about what they did. They just did it. So when, when the people realize that they are not about treaties, that they are the new Indian agents of old, as I call them, only then that they can get on the right path to protecting. So I believe that we could form our own tribunals, our own court systems, if you will, and that would be the right way to go. Um, I'm not sure if there's any courts, whether it's... Uh, Provincial courts, the Court of Queen's Bench, um, you know, I'm not sure that these courts can be objective because to be a judge, all you need to do is be a good liberal, a good conservative, and where the NDP are, good NDPers. And that's the only criteria. No one elects them. So they have to serve their masters, and, and that's the problem that we encounter. So... How, how do Elisi Buktu gets out of this? I don't know. I have a few ideas what, what I believe is right. Whether people would do what I believe is the right way to go is another question. Well, tell us. This is archived forever. <laughs> well, I, I believe that um, we have to empower um, indigenous women, Mi'kmaq women in this case. Uh, I can't say all of them because I know that you know, I would even guess and say that 60% of Mi'kmaq people have been won over to the power of money. And there's no way you can change that. And it'd be futile even to make an effort to. But you still have about 30% of or more people who, who, who are leaning toward um, treaties, treaty rights. And... Um, that would be the right way to go because these laws are powerful because in in the treaty rights uh, they said they're guaranteed equal to female persons which is indigenous women and then in section 52 1 it says that Canada's Constitution are the supreme laws of Canada and any law that's in conflict with this is null void and to no effect and you have to realize that what those heavily armed men did, like 800 of them. The government of New Brunswick, Premier David Allward, is saying we had to enforce a court injunction. Can you imagine that? Hmm. Court injunction. Need 800 
heavily armed men, men who came here with the intent to kill. Wow. So there is an easy way out, and I'm sure there's some sympathetic uh, court system somewhere, but I just don't know where it's at. They declared war on El Sabuktuk, Lady Zaga said. Absolutely. Without saying the words. Well, it's an invasion, that's what it was. In fact, there was foreign troops there. You know, uh, David Allward himself prides himself on uh, interprovincial trade. These, there's some police that came here from Quebec and some from Nova Scotia and Ottawa. PEI. PEI, yeah. Uh, Newfoundland, I hear. Yeah. So, my answer, you know, like, the, I, I, um, I don't want to be seen as disagreeing with any of the people that are involved with the um, uh, protest, but um, I believe some of them got it wrong. You know, when they put out a brochure using words like First Nations, um, recognizing the province of New Brunswick, um, you know, the treaties were never signed with the province of New Brunswick. And uh, as I said a while ago, First Nations is not um, is not a, a constitutionally recognized term. It's a man-made one. In fact, I seen recently a statement where it says that it's not um, it's not official. It's not constitutional. It's just a, a, just a word used by men. But it's catching on. So you know if if. Um, if some of the people who are protecting rights want to use that, I, I, I don't want to be seen being in disagreement with them. But what uh, would you use? Well, I would use the right words. I mean, indigenous people, Aboriginal peoples. I mean, you know, Micmac people. There's nothing wrong with that. Micmac is an Aboriginal or Aboriginal is a Micmac. So there's nothing wrong with that. And they could use that, and they should. You know. So. Uh, like, you know, here's um, here's a little something here. Where I where I first read that, I, I, I couldn't believe, you know, that someone is given so much credibility to where where none is due. And and you know, uh, they're speaking about under section thirty five of the Canadian <coughs> Constitution as elaborated in numerous Supreme Court of Canada. Decisions the government of New Brunswick is required to consult with First Nations. You know, I don't know if I agree with that because, you know, there is a Supreme Court ruling that does say that. But I'm pretty damn sure it, 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 there's no word in there for First Nations and then, and then the government of New Brunswick. I mean, I, as I said a while ago, and I told some of these people that the government of New Brunswick, no that these chiefs are on record of not supporting a treaty in Aboriginal right. They're, they're consenting to us as being minorities, and that's not true, but that's what it is. And unless and until it's undone, nothing can happen. You know, um, I'm a big supporter uh, of these people when it comes to um, standing up against um, oil companies coming here to, to do fracking in the manner in which they want to do it, I just viciously oppose that. And it's just not the right thing to do. You know, and then there's another part of the the uh, agreement, you know. There's another one that was the one um, on June 26, 2014, the Supreme Court of Canada decision on uh, Tilsi Cotton at that British Columbia. They took one, yeah. Chuck Horton, Williams. Anyway, um, made it evident that New Brunswick government not only had an obligation to consult, but the government needed to consent to proceed. You know, I'm not sure that's true, because what that court case did was identify our ancestral traditional lands. And this paper doesn't spell it out that way. So there's a few other questions that, that um, needs to be said, you know. Like, I, I, I know that the, whoever wrote this, the intent is good, but they don't know what they meant who was representing them then. In fact, I'm going to tell you, 
in, uh, at the uh, constitutional conferences that took place in Ottawa, the 2nd to the 5th of November, 1981. That was the first constitutional conference that Indians were given delegate status. At that time, the unelected president of the Union of the Brunswick Indians, Reed Nicholas, was also the board of directors to the National Indian Brotherhood. And he sat on about four different councils there. Like he sat on the uh, executive council, the council of elders, and of course they had their own executive council, and then the joint councils of chiefs. Plus, he was the board of, um, pardon me, he was the chairman of the NIB Finance Committee, the last chairman, you know. And um, he sat at the constitutional table in Ottawa as a delegate. He chose, to, he chose to be a provincial delegate. He could have been a federal delegate, but he chose to be a provincial delegate. He sat at the constitutional table with Premier Richard Hadfield, who voted to remove title from Section 34. They dropped it. So... See these these people here, they don't know that, and 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 unless they're open-minded enough to say, well, wow, is that true? Is that what happened? Yes, it is, and um, only with this uh, Williams case from British Columbia, when the Supreme Court ruled that um, they have an ancestral title to the land. I mean, this is not one little piece of land, or not one little rock over there, or, or another one over there. They're talking about our land, mm -hmm. Micmac land. You're talking about the Chilcotin chief, Roger Williams? Yes, yes. I, I, I can't pronounce the name of that Indian. Chilcotin. Chilcotin. And um, I met with them in Halifax. In fact, they were quite pleased. I stood and talked with them for about 45 minutes. And uh, they explained all that to me. Of course, I had a good introduction because I met their lawyer in uh, Fredericton around the 27th and 28th of March this year. And uh, we had a little, <laughs> little bit of a discussion, but um, but he was a, a nice enough guy, an open, open-minded kind of guy. Where uh, when I met them in Halifax, he had told them that he met with me before, and of course, he he identified me as being one of the original uh, supporters of the Treaty on Aboriginal Rights in 1983. Um, so when uh, the General Assembly of the uh, AFN was over. We all gathered by the door someplace. That's about, we stood there for about 45 minutes, and they're explaining that case to me. And in fact, he told me, there was three, four different chiefs there, but he, one of the chiefs told me that they went to see Sean Athleo, and Sean Athleo is from our neck of the woods, you know. And all he did was uh, give us lip service, nothing. We got nothing from him. We had to find our own money. We didn't have money. Uh, when we found a lawyer... If that lawyer said, well, let's do it this way, this way, this way, and that way, he said, that's when we got rid of him. So we want a lawyer who's going to do what we want him to do or do what, you know, and that's how they did it. And they had to find their own money. It wasn't easy. It took them like, I don't know, I want to say 25 years, but well over 20 years. They, they it was, was 25 years. 25 years, yeah. They struggled with that. So now, you know, uh, that's that's in Canada. And that was an eight to nothing unanimous decision no dissenting opinion no you know it's pretty uh, revolutionary uh, no longer is consultation uh, with the uh, Aboriginal people an issue anymore and they have to get outright consent and uh, we know that in terms of the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline uh, almost all the territories is crossing uh, say no to it so uh it's yeah it's a pretty uh, monumental decision uh well but you got to look at it this way um i stand to be corrected but i believe i'm right that uh, that the treating aboriginal rights in new brunswick are formally not recognized and that came from the chiefs of new brunswick and in a resolution that was given to the government of new brunswick and in uh, it doesn't really matter that much about what uh, the Chukotan people uh, did. It doesn't apply here because th these chiefs are, are formally on record of not supporting and not recognizing the treaty and Aboriginal rights. In fact, that's the Mi'kmaq could probably get away with that by saying, well, yes, we do, because I was there, and I'm proud to tell you that I'm a Mi'kmaq. But 
but the maliceets might have it different. You know, the maliceets are pretty much the power here. So maliceet people, political people that is, the everyday people probably believe they have a right, and maybe they do. But certainly it was their leaders who in uh, 1776, uh, they were summoned to Halifax. And, um, and in 1779, uh, a delegation went to Halifax. Their, their, their shamans, their grand chiefs, uh, the essence of their government went there. And they, made a, they signed a treaty with um, His Majesty. In fact, the Mi'kmaq were there before, and the, the governors offered the Mi'kmaq, if they sign, we'll give you this gun, and they'll give you this sword, and we'll give you a hat full of money. And the Mi'kmaq refused. They took the gun, they took the sword, but not the hat full of money. Mm -hmm. So in 1779, uh, the Maliseet were there, and they accepted the sword, the pistol, and the money. And a hat full of money. Yeah. So, and um, they said this, this treaty would come into force 10 years hence, which means 1789. So I found this written in Treaty Surrenders in Ottawa in a book um, on page 28 and 29 in 1905. Maliseets are registered there as surrendering a treaty right. And... Um, that's what that's that's what happened, and then in 1982-83, the Maliseet people did not support the Treaty and Aboriginal Rights process that took place in 1983. Did not. So there's a written uh, statement. It might be case law, where it says that if you surrendered a right before 1982, you're deemed not to have a treaty right. So. If this title thing came into being in 19, I mean 2014, then uh, what does that say about um, the uh, president of the Union of the Brunswick Indians? As, as I said, he was unelected, but still was the president of the Union of the Brunswick Indians, who had the support of the chiefs, 15 of them, maybe 19 of them, and um, in 1981. At a constitutional conference, they, they voted down Section 34, which was land title. And it was dropped from the constitutional uh, resolution. So, you know, you have to understand whether people want to believe it or not. You have to understand that you probably don't have a treaty right, especially the Maliseeds. Um, Micmac, for some reason, you know, of course, there was James Simon. He contested a treaty right in 1985. And then Donald Marshall again in 1999. And there was have been a couple of uh, cutting wood kind of court cases uh, advanced by Micmac. And I think there was one by a Polchus guy from Woodstock. But still, uh, most of the Micmacs, I think they always believed they had a treaty right. And, and that might be true for Maliseets too, but um, the, their leaders who were in a position uh, speaking for them uh, never supported a treaty right process. And, you know, I've seen a statement where, you know, women like Alma Brooks said, uh, we're uh, pretty mad at the uh, New Brunswick government for not recognizing ancestral land titles and things like that. But, I mean, does she want to believe me that men that represented her never recognized the treaty right? I don't think she does because I spoke to her before and I think she thinks I'm nuts, you know, crazy. Or, I don't know, she probably have other words to describe me, but I won't get into that right now. No, you're, you're one tough cookie and it's great that you speak your mind you know, of course, you have enough naysayers, you know. In Toronto, we would call them uh, the Cadillac chiefs, you know, the ones <laughs> taking the money and they're driving by their people living in third world conditions, you know. Um, you have a lot of respect following the live chat during this show, you know, from people all over the world. Not just here, but I'd like to thank uh, 
you know, uh, Occupy Wall Street's live stream mothership, Global Revolution for restreaming us live, and, uh, um, um, you know, Occupy TV and others who are restreaming us. You do? Yeah, live. Why don't you tell them to contact me or... Uh, Can't do that? Yeah, yeah. You could... You want to... Your email or how? Oh, I how, don't. How, 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 oh, how do you? How do I'll, they contact? I'll, 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 how about a phone number? No good. Whatever, it's up to you. Okay, um, it's uh, 16 Main Street, Eel River Bar. 16 Main Street. How do you spell that? Eel E. Uh huh. E. Two E's. Okay. L. Uh huh. Then River. River Bar. B A R. I'm sad to say, but you have to put NB. Yeah. And then area code is um, E8C. E8C. 3A4. 3A4. <laughs> I'll give you a phone number too. Is that okay? It's 252. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. Uh, it's 506. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, wait. Uh, one five oh six. Okay, go ahead. Two five two. Two five two. Twenty three. Twenty three. Fifty nine. Fifty nine. Yeah. Two five two. Twenty three. Yeah. Okay. Tom, um, uh, well, you know, thank you very much. Where does it say that if people are listening? Mm, uh, right here. They're they're typing. See, and remember what I said before, because this is your first, by the way, folks, this is the first time Hector's ever been on live stream. So half of what it is to live stream is happening here. The other half is on the live chat. Okay. So they're watching live and asking questions. But then there's other live stream channels which are mirroring us. They have their own separate live chat. But mo most of them know if they want to ask you questions to jump on to the Occupy Toronto mm -hmm. live stream channel. Um, yeah. Well... Um, I'm, I'm pleased to do this and um, I, I would like to have people ask other questions but um, maybe this is all so new to you um, you just don't know what kinds of questions to ask but in concluding I would like to tell you the listener and you who care out there that what's in trouble in this country of Canada is constitutional law, the written word. You know, in Canada's constitution, I think on the second page, if you open the cover, it clearly reads... It's okay. ...that Canada is founded on the principles that recognizes the supremacy of God and the rule of law. Of course, we know there's God, their God, that's Jesus Christ, and we're talking about their Bible, but still it's there, you know? And, um, and still, these men uh, continue to assassinate this, this written book, you know? And um, so, nothing is sacred to them. So, that's what you need to know. I mean, okay. when, you, when you speak out um, and the world can hear you, can read you, we know that in Egypt, it was social media that made all the difference. And um, in this country, um, don't be misled. To believe that it isn't the police state and um so you but still keep vocal and you can help that way thank you uh rise pdx from occupy wall street's global rev has a question he, he would like to know your ideas on how to wake people up or how we're gonna defeat these people how do we wake people up mm -hmm. well stop listening to mainstream media so <laughs> that's that's a good point. Well, how do you how do you wake people up? But the thing you have to understand that uh, people are so conditioned, people are so conditioned to be so passive, you know, that um, and people live with so much fear. Uh, people are conditioned to be consumers. Um, you know, I would say that if if 60% of the world continues to sleep, well, that's okay. That's an advantage for those of us who have other things to do. Because that way, you only need 
maybe a small percentage because I mean look at the power of the one percent that owns most of the industry of the world they're not worried about uh, the other 99 percent they're worried about holding on to power and they're doing a good job at it so we could do the same thing you know you you have to believe that 60 percent of the people are asleep all the time and um there's nothing you can do about it you know you're just totally indifferent to, to everything you know so when 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 you look at numbers like that that means you have 40 percent so you need only maybe 15 or 20 percent of this 40 percent and you should be happy with that and i think we could be happy with that too because um you know we are the shepherds and they're the sheep and that's how it has to be seen there is no answer you know uh, the quicker you get away from organized religion that that would be best the only way lady zaga says we need your help hector this is a good medium for you um you know what the what live stream is a very very new medium it is such a new medium that there is no word history in any language for live stream live stream in any language is live stream and what i what i say to we've done this channel that you're on we've done more first nations and i don't know more programming than anybody else in the world and we say this a lot as well that of any sector of society for lack of a better way of putting it that the aboriginal people get live streaming uh, the mm. most interactive medium ever better than anyone else uh, and that shouldn't surprise anyone uh, because mainstream media certainly has never ever been a friend of the aboriginal people they they are you know part of the colonial mentality so here you have the most interactive medium ever um, and the first nations people they get it this is one of the reasons why we we're invited here to also book talk she said speak on the vatican yes well, um, when we were children, the government of Canada sent us to Catholic schools. So what I'm about to tell you, I can tell you firsthand and from personal experience. I stopped believing in that crap probably when I was 14. And um, I have since uh, believed that the Vatican should be brought down. And I'll propose a way for you how to do it. You organize uh, a group in every country that you are in contact with. You know, maybe uh, Asia, maybe Europe, Africa, whatever. And um, everyone files a lawsuit all about the same time and make it mind-boggling kind of figures you know and it's easy to do because you know like um all these sexual violations that's that's being done by um members of the clergy uh, the priests and the cardinals um you know it's no secret anymore they want us to believe that it's um oh yes there's a few and we're doing the best we can to to deal with it that's not the truth in fact um just when i was coming to illicit book Duke today i was reflecting on something that i read and um, it came from this new york city and um they uh, I, I don't know the cardinal's name but anyway he showed up at a gay bar you know, in a limousine, chauffeur-driven limousine, but of course he wasn't dressed up as a clergyman. And but anyway, so somebody in there recognized him. You know, Cardinal, is that you? What are you doing here? Well, of course, you know he was looking for his boyfriend somewhere, and uh, he says, "Hi, uh, it's nothing new. I do that all the time." He says, "Well, I mean, I'm a cardinal. Do you know who I am?" He says, "Who's going to believe that anyway? You know, who, you can say you can complain to anybody you want. No one's going to believe you because I'm sacred. I'm a cardinal." <laughs> so, so I think you know that's uh, a criteria enough. There's a lot of things I'd like to tell you, but I don't want to say it right now. But uh, that has to be brought down. 
they have no shame. You know, this guy Francis that's there now, uh, media's given him good coverage and um, presenting him um, as um, as um, the ultimate diplomat. In fact, New York Mag Time Magazine made him man of the year or something like that, you know? So, um, how do you, the, the Vatican is ugly and um, there's only one thing they understand is money. So file major lawsuits against them for staggering amounts and then when you win your case and if you win your case um, you can build some schools for indigenous people. In the Atlantic region there's only one high school on the Indian res. Out of the four provinces there is only one Micmac High School. Can you imagine that? Wow. Wow. So the Vatican sued them. It's money. It's money will bring them crumbling down. If they said they are broke, well, they can start taking their gold pieces down from the wall, mm -hmm. melting them down, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. giving them to you for beating them in courts. Yeah. Powerful. They're powerful men. But don't forget, they've only been there since the fall of the Roman Empire. And when even even when the Roman Empire was in existence, the, the, the Catholics could move about. They, they, they could take advantage of the Roman courts, which was good to them. And, uh, of course, uh, they didn't return the compliment. What do you call it? Reciprocal? <laughs> mm -hmm. They didn't do the same thing for others. They just, they were brutal. So I have no sympathy for them. Thank you. Yeah, neither do we and neither do the viewers on the live chat. Yar. 800 criminal charged in Canada for clergy sexual abuse. Yeah. Yeah, Friends. Lady Zaga knows a lot about yeah. that. Then nephew is a car accident. Vatican has so much gold. While children starve. Well, you Can't know, believe people don't see the hypocrisy. Well, it's not hypocrisy. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what it is. It's philosophical, you know, and um, they they um, they are they are patriarchal, you know, and how can people continue to believe in them? I don't know, but they actually believe that people originated from men. <coughs> not easy to believe, but a lot of them do. In fact, I'd say if there's three million Catholics in the world, <laughs> that's what they believe. And if the earth is 5,000 and something years old, that monk proved it. <laughs> it's amazing. How limited. But, you know, you know, I'll tell you what they told us. And this is only like in the 1960s, you know. The Beatles were singing then. Um, they used to tell us that never in our lifetime will mankind travel a million miles. Never. And, um, you know, of course... Uh, when we started to get away from that kind of crap and started, you know, reading major newspapers and we found out that the American space program, the Columbia, they just send the, that spaceship around the world 64 times in two and a half days. Just totally amazing. I mean, I don't know, I think the world, what, 24,675 miles once around? I don't know, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they they were they had so much power and so much influence over our lives, and so limited in every which way. Mm -hmm. The cricket sounds. Well, one way to wake up the people, as Rise pointed out, is is what we're doing here and uh, civilian journalism. Because one thing that all these things like Bundy Ranch uh, this year and Ferguson just recently um, that people are turning off of mainstream media uh, because it's just owned by a handful of entities and all you're getting is propaganda and more and more people are waking up to the fact and turning to civilian journalism and social media for their news and certainly the sword and shield of Occupy and the sword and shield of of social media has always been the live stream here because seeing is believing and and the fact of we've never in human history had a more interactive medium like right now we artists uh, the this is live and 
you know, the viewers are commenting mm -hmm. as we're creating the art and vice versa for the viewer, the audience. They've never had a more interactive medium. And this is only possible because our window is the browser. And um, it's a thing of beauty, which Occupy perfected. And, and it's we're still in the pioneering days of live stream. Uh, most of the world, most of the people don't get it like in terms of mainstream media or the 1% and they're trying to wrangle it and um, you know I, I think you know you should be doing more live stream and you're of course always welcome um, on the live stream anytime uh, the viewers love what you're saying you know they can listen to you for hours well I'm, I only have one small confession that I would like to make because I didn't know what, until you just said that. Um, I read the Global Mail every day. I, I, I used to read other newspapers, but I just, um, I just gave up on them. And I thought that with the Global Mail, I was getting at least five newspapers in one. And so I do that every day. But... Uh, I shouldn't say but. I, sh I didn't know the difference, you know. But I still see it as a corporate media. But still, uh, I, I still I still get it every day. And um, I live at the Indian Res, and there's really not much. Well, there's a lot you could do, but there's not really nothing you can do. You know, there's, you know, like um, the uh, people are so highly controlled from within our offices, you know. And uh, people are just so conditioned that, it's just a money orientated thing and um, it's, it's sad but that's how it is so for me I um, I have a bicycle and I use that to go into town I got about seven seven miles or roughly 12 kilometers um, around trip thing so I, I use my bicycle probably probably about 50 clicks a day but reading <laughs> the Globe and Mail is what I do. Well, you could read between the lines. Oh, of course I do. I mean, I yeah. there's a lot of crappy stuff that I don't want to agree with at all. But there's some things I I, I, I pick out what I like, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, but I, I don't have um, you know like um, I don't have uh, access to um, computer systems, you know. And uh, I don't have access to the world in this way. Yeah, so you're not on Skype or no, Facebook. I've got a cell phone, and that's about all. Mm -hmm. yes, I mean, you know, uh, I um, there's so much that should be said, and I don't say it. But um, you know, like I'm pleased to share with you both these constitutional conferences. You know. Because, um, see, we, we didn't invent those words, constitutional, because when we were sitting around the table, we were talking about treaty rights, treaty rights, treaty rights. And, of course, you know, I, it was the federal government. It was like Pierre Trudeau, and they taught us that word, you know, whether it's good or not. I don't know. But when they, when they told us that they were going to write in the treaty on Aboriginal rights, they would become supreme laws. And of course, we in a Catholic school remembered them telling us so many times, in fact, <laughs> pounding into our heads that God is supreme, you know. So we, we felt that that's not <coughs> a good place to be, you know. If, if treaty rights were going to be written in and there were going to be supreme laws, that's good. But, you know, I feel extra good, and I share this with you and your listeners, is that. You know, I'm born on the Indian Reservation. Um, my mother was a pretty strong kind of woman. You know, she didn't want white society doctors. She didn't want no priests. She didn't. She in fact had two Micmac women who were midwives. They delivered me, and um, that's just how it was. You know, so we um, we we lived um, uh, uh, in um, in a simple manner and. There was no luxuries and things like that, but that's just how we grew up. We we were hunters and trappers, and you know we had to go shoot a duck for our next meal and things like that. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I'm glad this this your first live stream experience has been very pleasant. Uh, certainly, you have a very receptive worldwide audience here. Rise PDX is from Portland, you know, Lady Zaga, Fred 109 in Toronto, and Sun Dave in uh, Santa Rosa, California, outside of San Fran. And uh, how long did your mom live? Oh, she got. She worked herself out of existence, a hard, hard working woman. She chopped wood and got water at the well and everything. Men, men didn't do much work. It was the women who did all the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, um, the, I don't know if that was a, a traditional thing among the Mi'kmaq, but I grew up with strong women. And you probably grew up with three generations under one roof. Mm, well, probably. Because my my grandfather and my grandmother, they were living on a trap line still. We, we used to have beaver meat, roast beaver meat. <laughs> Hard to believe that, but it's true. You know, and um, so they they were of the old line of hunters and trappers, and. Um, they, you know, like, they were hounded and harassed all the time by the Mounties and brought into the courts. On the 28th of March, 1929, about seven of these men were all charged for having illegal possession of deer meat. Actually, they had six deer on their sleds coming out. And uh, when they got to the court, <clears throat> the judge made the claim, the Crown Prosecutor made the claim that well, if you're hungry, why didn't you go see the Indian agent? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 it's true. And um, so that's just how it was, you know. And, you know, it's they they stole our language. They stole our... The Nick were actually had a good writing system. He really did. And um, it's... Well, they call it hieroglyphics, you know, but it was really... Um, 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 ideograms, whatever that is, and then of course the early missionaries call it characters, and uh, it was found by a French missionary by the name of um, Christian Leclerc in July of 1677 at a place now called Carleton, Quebec. That's where he first found the Micmac writing system being used, and um, but then someone said there was other people who found that 40 years before that. So it was there, but it's not now. Lady Zaga says, this is your maiden voyage, Hector, on the digital fireboat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But um, I, I, um, I expect... Um, women of the world to wake up and to save us. Yeah. Because men have done enough damage um, to Mother Earth. And as we like to say on this channel, this live stream channel is only sponsored since day one. All natural Mohawk from Aquasasni. Mm -hmm. From the original tobacco traders um, so um, I don't know when or when I'll get the chance to speak to you again but um, I always like to share some ideas with people and um, I, I believe that um, the biggest threat to humanity is organized religion and someone needs to deal with it. You know, Christianity would be a good place to start. <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's not that I believe that, um, uh, you know, in other religions, but certainly in, in, in the Western world, it's, it, it's, it's a multinational and they're very wealthy. I gotta get my car off the road. Okay. So, thank you very much. And today is what, the, the 3rd of September? Yep, we just uh, 
We're at actually 12.34, 1, 2, 3, 4 on September 4th now, because oh. we turned Thursday. Okay. Yes. Well, and, I, and I'll show you where you can sleep up here. Yeah, I'm going to get my car set up over there, too. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Hector. Well, thank you, and a, uh, I, I enjoyed that, and, um, but I was thinking that uh, I'd hear people's voices, you know? No, not yet. This, we, we're we pioneering a lot of new technology for live stream, including universal translators and, okay. and whatnot, and a more interactive live chat. Right now, all they have is text. Like I said, we're in the mm -hmm. super pioneering days, mm -hmm. barely three and a half, four years, really, at mm -hmm. this level of technology. Uh, and Occupy, you know, really has fueled mm -hmm. so much of it. Part of it is to allow the viewers, right now all they have is text, but yeah. we won't, would like to have audio or video, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we've did, done early pioneering experiments in that, and uh, and we're working on new software, uh, mm -hmm. live streaming software to allow the viewers that, mm -hmm. or universal translators, so that if someone's watching from France, yeah. They'll get subtitles like in a movie oh, yes, in French, yeah, okay. right? If yeah. we're in Quebec and you don't understand French, yeah. we live streamers can actually see, you know. Or if you're in Romania and you're typing in Romanian, you know, yeah, all this live chat is translated into Romanian so for you. Where's where did uh, people come make ask questions? Those are like where yeah, people that's come in? that's the live chat, and like they were saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, let me let me just look at it. I, I didn't see that because I just I want to be able. To yeah. See so it. this is called the live chat, and then this is where we're at here on screen. Okay. Uh, how many minutes? The Shanger. That's me. Okay. Uh, thank you. I uh, speech now. Okay, Aiden Voyage. Joy is here to Arizona. Um, thank you. That's for you. Platform speech now. Mm -hmm. Universal translator will be so nice. Yeah, protect the water. Yeah. That's what I should have said too, but I forgot. It's okay. It's right behind you, right here. Okay. Right? Yeah. That's it. Okay. Understanding needs some medicine for now. Yeah. Well, I've been relaying questions from the live chat to you. Mm -hmm. Right. We are responding to you in the chat, Hector. Yeah. But it's you know we it's a brand new medium you know I say to people you shouldn't be bringing a lot of baggage to live stream like if you're a filmmaker you bring a lot of filmmaking baggage because mm. no longer is the process of making film a private act but yeah. now it's a public act yeah because we're live. Um, <laughs> <laughs> D, your channel is a lake, a place on the stream where water gathers. Thank you, son, Dave. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and you just, by fluke, you know, uh, I've done about 900 films in my life as an anthropological documentary mm -hmm. filmmaker, and yeah. in the last... 13 years I've done 4,500 streams. Yeah. It's the equivalent of a film. And I host the only master class show on how to live stream. Mm -hmm. And it was really good that uh, you came on. And I invite you on at your leisure anytime. Thank you. Well, you know, um, I like to hear what other people say and think, you know, but um, I don't see that much but it's good to like you said the world is listening out there it's uncensored exactly yeah. you know um because i as i say this a lot of all the senses your eyes represent the ultimate truth and i always say the example 
you know, sad as it might be, but you'd rather want to see a car crash than me describe it to you orally or you hear it a block away. Mm -hmm. It doesn't represent truth unless yeah. you see it. And that's the beauty of live stream, why it's mm -hmm. the sword and shield of social media. Because yeah. if, say, you have a major rally or mm -hmm. you got a live streamer on the front line mm -hmm. on October 17th, um, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, represents the ultimate truth. Yeah. Um, there wasn't any live stream on the front line. There, you know, they were sort of there. Um, and what we found so far here in North America that, uh, well, especially for me dealing with the Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal police, that when I'm live on the front lines, mm -hmm. it is the only thing that protects cops that want to beat the crap out of people. Mm -hmm. That so far, knock on wood, um, cops are no longer scared of people with video cameras or still cameras. They'll mm -hmm. still beat the crap out of people because they know they could seize that video camera mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. think. But when you're live, especially that Occupy Toronto, our reputation precedes us, mm -hmm. they are scared shitless. I know for a fact that if I was here October 17th, which I was not, mm -hmm. it would not have gone down as hard as it did, mm -hmm. right? And we know all the new police tactics against us. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah. Um, well, um, you know, uh, we're off to the line now, right? No. No, no we're still alive. Oh. Um, you know, um, I wanted to hear people say what they want to do to um, to help themselves in um, dealing with what took place here. And um, I read in one of those brochures that someone was saying, well, we're going to hire a lawyer and we're going to raise uh, a lot of money, 10000 bucks or something like that. He wants for down payment. You know, I, I, I thought we were going to talk about that, you know, because, you know, that's not the way to go. You know, hiring a lawyer, yeah, that's a business. That's like condemning one business and supporting another business. And the, the right way to go is, um, you know, people, everyday people can do that, you know. Like we, we have so much blind faith that that's placed on um, law firms, you know. And and that's wrong. Because uh, yeah. I, I firmly believe that um, those men and some women they have no idea, no clues at all what's happening here. And besides that, they have to follow rules. We don't. We can go to court and we can make our own mistakes. They go to court and they have the, that form or that form or maybe uh, that motion or that motion. Like, you know, you could probably say good words about the lawyers that represented those two men that were in jail from October till the 27th of August, but at the same time, it was a plea bargain. Yeah. And they still were found guilty. Mm -hmm. And see, the thing is, is that with quicker action in that time, you know, those men could have been out of jail sooner and not be convicted on anything. Just like one of those guys was sitting around the table a while ago. He told me that he, he, they hired uh, T.J. Burke. And they asked me, what do you want to think of T.J. Burke? Well, I said, let me show you something. Uh, I don't know if he understood what I told him, but I showed him anyway. I said, here's Bill C-36. This is a terrorist act. And I said, this is how they define the Attorney General and the Solicitor General. In the Criminal Code of Canada, the, uh, the Solicitor General and the Attorney General were defined only as the federal. But in this term, the, the Solicitor General and the Attorney General also means the provincial. So I said, can you imagine for four years he was the, you know, he, he was seeing us as terrorists? I said, how can you go to see a man, uh, even as your lawyer? when he was he was the man that the RCMP command went to see almost on a daily basis to brief him or get briefings or get things done. 
No, it's a shame. The that's Solicitor really General, they call him the top cop that's here right. in Canada. That's right. And, and, and that was T.J. Burke. And yet these people are going to see him for representation. That's sad. Mm -hmm. it's really sad. Well, anyway, um, you know, I, uh, I'll tell you the truth. I wanted to go home earlier, but I was so busy talking, I'm not realizing the time. Eh? Because the other night I went up as far as Eagle Ground, and uh, I, uh, I wanted to see a friend, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so I'm going to go get my car off the road now. Okay. Thank you, Hector. Yeah, thank you. Yes, my name is D. Shanger. I'm a mod and live stream director here at Occupy Toronto since day one. That was Hector Picto, ex national chief of the Atlantic regions. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, he's just moving his car now. Um, we'll, we'll see there, Fred. We'll see. Um, and stuff. It is a uh, quarter to one in the a.m. here in New Brunswick. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. He is going to sleep over here at Gopit Lodge. And this is the info. If you want to talk to Hector. Um, he is not on any social media, including email. He has no access to computer unless he goes to the library. So he doesn't really have a email. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, um, he, um, here in El uh, you know, he has a very amazing reputation. People can listen to him for hours, uh, as you have. It, it was a brief two-hour discussion we had with him. He's very, very knowledgeable. He is in the category of a good chief, you know, that really works for his people. And really, he has been lambasted by a lot of opposition, a lot of the Cadillac chiefs the sellout chiefs um, you know he's been raked through the mud but you know what he's one tough cookie um, you know his thing is to protect the people um, last Sunday he came here to Gopit Lodge he had attended last weekend's uh, Elsa Book Dug Powwow the 28th annual one and he always was following what was going on here and he was glad he finally made it and uh, you know, we had a feast here, and uh, he loved the vibe here. He ended up sleeping here, and um, and uh, I invited him to come to the community meeting here every Wednesday night, and um, and the uh, invite him on this show, and uh, and it's his first live stream, and uh, so I think he finally gets the hang of it. He thought for some reason that he'd be able to hear your voice. See, he's right on the ball, man. Uh, I think he's digging this interactivity. And um, uh, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, Jim Pikachu, the uh, Mi'kmaq um, Warrior Society General uh, from the Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq. Uh, Warrior Society. Uh, no, um, I don't think so. But then, you know, a lot of the big dues are um, related. I haven't asked him that question. Yeah, um, yeah, lots of big dues here in New Brunswick. There's that. And <laughs> Za dip him slowly or he may retreat in shock, says Rise PDX. Yar. Uh, yeah. It, it was a good break that we took in August. Um, no, Za. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, now we're back in the rhythm. And um, yeah, I, I did tell him that and I will tell him that again. Um, but he, he has a deep knowledge of history and he was involved in history. He was the 
national chief for the Atlantic region during the 1982-83 Canadian constitutional talks. Um, and uh, no rise, I, I was lurking, even though I wasn't uh, live streaming much in August, I, I was lurking on Global Rev, following a lot of the Ferguson live streams. And uh, um, no, I saw enough of it. Um, yes, I should review it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Fred, I love that. Officer, go fuck yourself. Hashtag. <laughs> I like the uh, hashtag, hands up, uh, don't shoot. I think that's a great, uh, you know, I'll always remember that about uh, Ferguson. Um, uh, yes, Za. It's just, um, I was in a different, you know, I was in the more laid back rhythm. It was good to see you on GR there, Za. Yar. What's OGFY? Blushing. Mashable. <laughs> Yar. Um, give me one. Yeah. Wow. CNN showed the streams. Give me one quick second. Um. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I know the whole media blackout by Ferguson uh, PD. You know um, what happened to Mike Brown, and um, that a lot of international media was restreaming uh, the live streamers on the ground. So what's OGFY? Oh, go fuck yourself. Okay, good. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a new one. Okay, I thought it was something Ferguson something. Okay, good. <laughs> Yar. Yes, yeah, so, uh, yeah, tonight was certainly, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> yeah, we were heavily jammed early on tonight, um, that was weird, uh, I guess it was a welcome back, um, like that does anything to us, uh, you know, I will uh, um, take Hector's two-hour uh, Live stream, I'll put that on YouTube. I'll just upload the whole local master right after this uh, and post the link on uh, Facebook and all at the Gopa Lodge page. Yeah, I think it's a new NSA uh, algorithm software because I, I notice a lot of the kickers from when we were down, depending on what we're talking about, when we're talking about Harpo, you know, our prime minister, and it's not one of the Marx brothers. Um, and stuff or all word here and stuff but yeah well thank you 
Thank you, thank you everyone for watching. We're at the four and a half hour mark. This is episode 16 of Gopit Lodge's fracking show and Gopit in Mi'kmaq means beaver and pronounced go bit. And uh, I, I, I have cut the bandwidth, uh, you know, even though as a filmmaker, I like to have a higher bandwidth. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, you know, I have it low, you know, um, plus, you know, resolution for live stream is a hoodoo voodoo theoretical physics formula. Um, so many things to it. Um, but yes, so uh, thank you, folks. I think that's uh, all we have to say. We will get Hector back on sometime soon, and we'll let everyone know, um, either on Facebook or on the live chats. And Za, I'll text you, because uh, I know you're not on uh, Facebook. Um, but yeah. Yar. I hear you there, Fred. Okay, folks, so since we live streamers never say bye, but rather peace out and see you on the live chat. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, Rise and Global Rev for restreaming us. Thank you, Dan Marks, for restreaming us at Occupy TV and others. Um, the whole world's watching. The whole world's watching. I love what's going on in Fergus. Uh, not why it happened, but that enough is enough. You know what I mean? And um, keep up the great work, everyone. Yar. Alrighty. Ciao, folks. Yar.